The song may be over, but the melody will linger on. Today is a very special day for all of us because we are celebrating a legend. 98th birthday of Professor Sri Padmanadji Sri Varma Jaini. A teacher, a guru, a true friend, a mentor. Professor Sri Padmanabhji Jaini. Jai Janendra. On this beautiful day, on behalf of Jaina and Jain Center of Northern California, I, Savita Jain, welcome you to celebrate life of Professor Dr. Sri Padmanabhji Jaini. Let's begin with Mangala Charan and Ashir Vachan from Parampucha Sadviji Sri Sanghamitra Ji Mara Sahib. Jai Janendra. We celebrate Professor Padmanabh Jaini's life with much love and respect. Here is to a man of wisdom. Namo Arhantanam Namo Siddhanam Namo Ayariyanam Namo Vajjayanam Namo Loe Savasahunam Eso Panchanamo for the melodious beginning and your blessings, Guru Nisa. Now, I would like to invite Jaina President, Mr. Maheshji Vadhar. Maheshji Vadhar is an entrepreneur having built several businesses in the hospitality distribution sector and commercial real estate development. His passion for spirituality and humanitarian services has led him to become a leader in Jaina organization. In his philanthropic endeavors, he has helped foster support for health, education, and cultural activities. He is most proud of his work with helping to organize free medical camps within our local communities in Southern California, India, and Africa, as well as enjoying and fundraising for Jain studies at several universities. He is the president of the Federation of Jain Association in North America. Or mere andaz mein kahungi to jeshtata bhi hai, sreshtata bhi, manushya ki akruti bhi hai, prakriti bhi, anavirat seva karya hi, jin ka yashas tamba hai. Please welcome Mr. Mahesh Ji Vadhar. Thank you, Savita Ji, for the kind words. And I want to thank you, uh, Sangmitra Ji, for 
the heavenly voice uh, reciting the mangala charan namo ari hantanam pranam and jay janendra on behalf of jaina and jain center of northern california i thank you all for joining us today for celebrating the late professor padmanab ji jain is 98 birth anniversary his passing has left a profound void in the jain community worldwide the jain samaj lost a jewel of jain dharma a visionary individual with multiple talents firm resolve and a soft heart he was so much more than a preeminent religious scholar dr jaini can be rightly called the dean of jain education in india he taught jainism in india europe and in the us a prolific writer who wrote more than 80 papers on jainism and buddhism authored 17 books and translated some important scholarly works like editing buddhist scripture abhidharma from pali sanskrit and even french sources translating from hindi into english jain sectarian debate 84 points of contention choriyasi bol between shwetambar and digambars translation of long lost laguwat vaspota 10th century manuscript of amrit chandra suri ji hailing from rajasthan born in south india naturally he was fluent in tullu and kannada but he had mastery of gujarati hindi maharashtrian and english he also studied ardhamagdi prakrit sanskrit pali burmese thai and probably a few more he lived and worked in thailand burma ceylon indonesia and cambodia and developed scholarships in many facets of buddhism he first came to berkeley as a visiting professor in the summer of 1971 and next year he took a permanent position teaching buddhism he remained a luminary at berkeley for nearly 50 years and the most glaring tribute one can provide is in academia there has not been a scholar a humanitarian and a teacher like padmanabh ji and there is none like him on the horizon padmanabh ji is not here with us but we feel his presence love and kindness with us forever thank you jay janendra make each day your masterpiece why fit in when you are born to stand out you can steer yourself in any direction you choose when we look back at the life journey of shri padmanabh ji jaini we can easily say that there is no secret to success it is the result of preparation hard work and learning from experts how he kept climbing from getting his education from not so well known places to becoming a professor at berkeley this was only possible because of his profound knowledge and insights on a wide spectrum of subjects so let's take a look of some of his memories through this slide show
छोटी सी झलकियां हमने श्री पद्मनाभ जी जैनी के जीवन की देखी दे से सक्सेस इज नॉट हाउ हाई यू हैव क्लाइंट बट हाउ यू मेक अ पॉजिटिव डिफरेंस टू द वर्ल्ड जैनी जी हैव टचड सो मेनी लाइफ इनमें से ऐसी ही कुछ हस्तियां आज हमारे साथ मौजूद है जो उस मेमोरीज को वो फोन मेमोरीज को हमारे साथ साझा करने के लिए आतुर है सो so, मैं आमंत्रित करना चाहती हूँ सर्वप्रथम श्री प्रवीण जी जैन मिस्टर प्रवीण जी जैन को फाउंडर एंड बेनिफेक्टर मेंबर एंड पास प्रेसिडेंट ऑफ जे सी एन सी सिलिकॉन वैली इंटर रिलीजियस काउंसिल बोर्ड चेयर ऑथर of an introduction of jain philosophy trustee of the american foundation for the blind founding director of stanford center for asian health research and education please welcome mr pravin ji jain thank you thank you savita ji jai jinendra everybody uh, just want to uh, touch upon uh, professor padmanabhi padmanab jeni ji's life uh, so it it's a rare occasion that a spiritually astute and eminently wise soul descends as a human being to share the wisdom it has acquired over many lifetimes we at jain center of northern california are fortunate that a jiva of that stature in professor padmanab shri verma jaini came among us He was a great scholar in Jain and Buddhist studies, uh, with profound knowledge of various scriptures. His life is a shining example of an individual pursuing higher knowledge to disseminate it among others. Professor Jaini was born on October twenty-third, which is today, in nineteen twenty-three, in a small town called Nellikar near Mood Bidri, Karnataka, in India. the region is renowned for its jain temples such as the temple of the thousand pillars his father was a devout jain follower and actually changed his last name from shetty to jaini to foster his jain identity with inspiration from jagamandar lal jaini a prominent prominent jain scholar of that time to start his training in jain dharma at an early age padmanabh's father sent him to a gurukul a jain religious boarding school in the state of maharashtra which was considered at that time a far away place there professor jaini met pandit nathuram premi dr hiralal jain dr n a n upadhyay all of them were very known scholars at that time they helped him craft a sound spiritual foundation and motivated him to seek a higher studies in jain philosophy after schooling young padmanab continues a strong interest in dharmic studies and received undergraduate degree in sanskrit and prakrit from a college in nashik in maharashtra then he worked with renowned jain scholar pandit sukhlal sangvi for rigorous training in jain logic theory subsequently he went to sri lanka for his graduate studies in advanced and an advanced training in pali canon and buddhist scriptures he was the first recipient of the dharmananda kosambi memorial scholarship named after a prominent buddhist scholar at that time who was a friend of mahatma gandhi the scholarship was instituted on a special request by mahatma gandhi before his passing professor jaini was selected on the recommendation from kaka kalekar a disciple of mahatma gandhi professor jaini as as we can see excelled in sri lanka and the prime minister of the nation ds sanayake at that time invited him to his residence to bestow the esteemed degree of tripatak acharya he returned to india and for short periods taught in amdavad and at banaras university before joining the school of oriental and african studies or sos as a lecturer of pali and sanskrit languages in parallel he conducted research on abhidharma deepa a buddhist scripture under professor john burrow and was awarded a phd for his for his work then with an insatiable hunger for knowledge acquisition professor jaini went to myanmar burma at that time 
Indonesia, Thailand, Colombia, and other countries to learn various manuscripts of the Buddhist tradition. He studied, edited, and translated many manuscripts for the Pali Text Society. And after completing that work, he joined the University of Michigan as a professor of Indic studies. In 1972, Professor Jaini joined the University of California at Berkeley as the professor of Buddhist studies in the Department of South and Southeast Asian Studies. He had an illustrious career at UC uh, and co-founded UC's group of Buddhist studies. Professor Jaini retired from the UC in 1994, but continued to teach as a professor emeritus. To honor his legacy, the UC established an, an award for excellence titled Padmanabh S. Jaini Graduate Student Award in Buddhist Studies. In 2014, the faculty and students of the department organized a special symposium, the study of Jainism, a symposium in honor of Professor Padmanabh Jaini's 90th birthday. In addition to his unmatched acumen for research, scholarship, and teaching, Professor Jaini was well known for his oratory skills. And, and at Gen Center, we experienced, we were fortunate to experience that many times. His thorough knowledge and deep, deep scriptural understanding enabled him with inherently fluidic rendering of Jain and Buddhist teachings. He could deliver incredible impromptu speeches and spellbound his audiences. Professor Jaini authored several books. Uh, we saw that list uh, in the presentation. Uh, and he published articles, academic papers, and book chapters on Buddhist and Jain traditions. His book, Jaina Path of Purification, has been a significant source of Jain scholarship around the world. Some of his other publications are Gender and Salvation, Jaina Debates on Spiritual Liberation of Women. Collected Papers on Jaina Studies, Collected Papers on Buddhist Studies, and his own memoirs, Yoga Yoga, that he published in 2019. Professor Jaini's inspiration from his Eastern virtues is reflected in his masterful writings that combine his thorough knowledge of the Eastern philosophies and the respect he had for the Western culture and Western scholarship. His deep understanding and scholarly authority on the intricate details of Jain and Buddhist philosophies shine through all of his writings and lectures. Besides his academic work, Professor Jaini actively participated in Jain communities, spiritual, social, and dharmic activities. In 1975, he welcomed and hosted Acharya Sushil Kumar, the first prominent Jain monk to come to the USA, when he first arrived in California to start his spiritual journey in the West. In the same year, and this is remarkable for us uh, over here in Northern California, in 1975, Professor Jaini and other Jain residents of the area founded Jain Millen that became the Jain Center of Northern California later on. He was an ardent supporter and proponent of the Jain community and insisted that JCNC makes all necessary provisions to bring all the major Jain traditions under one roof with the theme, unity in diversity, irrespective of the followers, background, region, languages, etc. He was also a strong proponent, proponent of equal rights for women in religious practices and prompted JCNC founders to ensure that. Professor Jaini collected collaborated with Michael Tobias, the writer, producer, and director of the production of the PBS documentary, Ahinsa, Nonviolence, that was aired in 1987. In 1991, he worked with JCNC leaders to host the first Jaina convention in the San Francisco Bay Area and delivered the keynote speech at the conference. He moderated the session on ecology and Ahinsa and also on the life of Bhagwan Mahavira. Professor Jaini provided invaluable guidance and advice during the planning, design, and construction of Jain Bhavan, the Jain Temple and Community Center in Milpitas, California, in, in San Francisco Bay Area. 
Professor Jaini motivated the proliferation of Jain studies in colleges and universities nationwide, or we could say worldwide. He was an advisory board member of Ahinsa Sense, uh, a Center at Cal State Polytechnic University in Pomona. He later gifted his entire collection of rare Jain and Buddhist books to the Ahinsa Center. He motivated the creation of the Mohini Jain Presidential Chair for Jain Studies at the University of California, Davis, and was the keynote speaker at its inauguration in 2017. We could go on and on, but, but at the end, Professor Jaini left his body for heavenly abode on May 25 this year. His passion for teachings and sharing his wisdom stayed with him till his last day, as illustrated by the fact that he delivered a lecture to the UC students and faculty just a few days before his passing. Professor Jaini's life is an inspirational treatise for those who are aspiring to seek knowledge. He toiled as a sincere spiritual seeker in his early years, just like an ascetic disciple studying under his guru. Then after his multidimensional training and higher education, he started sharing his knowledge with his peers, colleagues, students, and other seekers. He did all this with a deep sense of giving. He was exceptionally accessible and freely pervaded his knowledge without any prejudice, arrogance, or any feeling of superiority over all those who sought it. It seems he acquired all his wisdom to spread the teachings of the enlightened jinnas in the world. Everyone who came in contact with Professor Jaini, his faculty colleagues and students at UC, and the entire fraternity of Jain and Buddhist scholars and the worldwide Jain community, we all felt gratified with a sense of pride of knowing him. We, the San Francisco, J uh, San Francisco Bay Area Jain community, are incredibly proud and grateful that he was one of the founders and active members of the Jain Center of Northern California from its inception till its last day. While we mourn his passing, we celebrate his life with admiration. There is hardly any doubt that his exceptional and eminently spiritual soul is on its way to eternal peace and liberation. We all pray for the ultimate success of his jiva's spiritual journey. Jai Jinendra, and thank you. Thank you, Praveen Ankalji. I can only say that the fragrance of flowers spreads only in the direction of the wind but the goodness of a person spreads in each direction, every direction. A child, a teacher, a book, a pen can change one's life. Kuch aise hi Shri Padmanabh ji jaini ke jivan se jude huye gine anchune pehlu aapke saamne lekar aa rahe hai panel led by Shri Sulek ji jain. Professor Padmanabh ji jaini a friend and a mentor. To start with, I will read a tribute by His Holiness Jagat Guru Sri Karma Yogi Swati Sri Charu Kirti Ji Bhattarak Ji from Shravan Belgola, India. Professor Padmanabh S. Jaini's long uninterrupted journey of over nine decades was studied with dedication to education, devotion to traditional knowledge. In the true sense of term, he was an ideal Shravak because he was destined to become one of the greatest scholars of our times. Jaini left his natal place very early in his childhood, but never lost his roots and identity. Since I was born in the same Tulu and Kannada speaking bilingual region, I knew P.S. Jaini's parents, who were both traditional and radical. He had imbibed the radical outlook of his father and literary flair from his mother, who was an extemporary poet. During my post-graduation course in history and philosophy, I had the benefit of reading his in invaluable articles and books. It is my pleasure to place on record that I was one of the many beneficiaries of his scholarly writings. 
One of the most memorable events in my 50 years long career as Bhattarak of Shravan Belgola is the bestowal of the first Prakrit Gnana Bharati International Award to Padmanabhji Jaini. It was an unique celebration. To remember Professor Padmanabh Jaini means remembering a great tradition of illustrious scholars. We thank you, Sri Swami Charu Kirtiji Bhattarakji for his message. Now please welcome Dr. Subodji Jain. Uh, Subodji just called me. He's having internet issues. So for now, if we can skip him and he may appear later, just wanted to let you know. Sure, thank you. So moving forward, um, I would like to invite Dr. Sri Hampa Nagaraja, who is who was one of the luckiest one to have close contact with Professor Jainiji. Due to health reasons, Dr. Hampa is here with us today, but my husband, Mr. Rahul Jain, is going to read a message from him. Dr. Hampa, also known as Hampana, scholar of Kannada language and Jainism, delivered guest lectures on Jainism at universities in UK, Germany, and USA, served in capacities like professor and dean of art faculty in Bengaluru University, Professor Dr. Hampa Nagarajan. Jainendra, hopefully I can do justice to uh, Dr. Nagaraja's uh, emotional writing that, uh, and his experiences with Janiji. Um, I remember vividly my first meeting with Padmanabh Jaini 60 years ago. A tall and handsome youth with traditional three-piece suit and plenty of hair sitting pretty on his head like a crown and an oval face. I cannot forget that sight. I had the same greatest regard for him that I've had for my teachers and parents. In one of many fruitful conversations, I requested him to mention his most memorable events in his life. He said, presenting a copy of his magnum opus, Jaina Path of Purification to His Holiness Pope at Vatican Center, his meeting with Dalai Lama, and the award of Prakrit Yan Bharti J International Award were three unforgettable events. Polyglot Jaini was a fluent speaker. His eloquence graced with commanding voice and sense of humor was extraordinary. Contemplating the me method and analysis of ancient basic texts, we find three types of scholars. One, A.N. Upadhyay was mostly concentrated on providing infrastructure by editing original Prakrit and Sanskrit texts with exhaustive introduction. Second, Hiralal Jain also did similar work but enlarged its scope by focusing on the cultural importance of Jaina, Agam, uh, art, architecture, and literature. Third, P.S. Jaini assimilated both methods but took a leap forward by giving a global dimension to the traditional knowledge. He lived longer than Upadhyaya and Hiralal Jain and had greater exposure. Making use of his extensive study and travel, Jaini combined an, a horizontal and vertical approach to comprehensive study of Jainism in all its aspects. He opened new vistas of comparative study with non-Jain streams of philosophy and Buddhism in particular. Professor Jaini accomplished this with mastery without losing his Jaina identity. It has to be underlined that like Akalancharya and other greats of the pre-medieval period, Jaini had studied basic polytexts with equally proficient in Jain as well as Buddhist studies. It was unique that he was highly respected by both Jain and Buddhist monks and scholars alike. Professor Padmanabh Jaini continues to live for centuries 
through his invaluable works full of insights. His three books, Jaina Path of Purification, Collected Papers on Jain Studies, and Collected Papers on Buddhist Studies, have been hallmarks and path-breaking. Researchers in the field of Jain, Jaina Studies have started a new binary method of approaching the subject as pre jaini period and post jaini period. I consider this as the greatest testimonial and crowning glory of his scholastic journey and everlasting contribution. In brief, he taught and wrote the quintessence of Buddhism and Jainism, two ancient coeval religions, wrote valuable books, lived a memorable and meaningful long life, and died a peaceful death. His death has created a void, and there are not many who could fill the vacuum. Even if a handful of eminent scholars emerged to keep the lamp of traditional knowledge burning bright, that would be befitting and meaningful Shraddhanjali to P.S. Cheney. Thank you, Dr. Hampana, for the beautiful writing, for the beautiful message. Thank you, Rahul Ji. Believe in your infinite potential. Your only limitations are those you set upon yourself. Professor Jaini Ji, who exemplifies this quote. Now, please welcome Ms. Mohini Jain. Mohini Jain, past president of Jain Center of Greater Sacramento, established Jain Chair at UC Davis in 2016, board member of Academic Liaison Committee and Jain Education and Research Foundation. Ms. Mohini Jain. Thank you and judgment to all my audience. Today, as we are celebrating Padmanabh Jaini. Uh, life contributions and life as and uh, we always some of us called him Jenny G out of affection and respect and that's how I will address him. I had very brief interaction with him, but the memory has been etched in my life, and I was lucky enough to both see him as a scholar as, as his achievements have been discussed over and over again, but also the human side of him which was very kind, gentle, giving, and supportive. So very briefly, I will touch on both. I met Jenny G for the first time when I moved to Davis in 1979, which was 43 years back. At that time, a couple of families in Davis and three families from Berkeley, we would celebrate Mahavi Jayanti and Mahavi Nirvana together as there were no Jain centers, no other means of getting together. And always the event started by a little short talk by Jenny G. And that was my first introduction to him because as has been said before, I was spellbound. I could not believe such a profound message was given in such simple words, such something that reached my heart. And not only that, I came home and wrote them down because I didn't want the words to be lost. And, uh, and they wouldn't be because they were remembered forever. And then as uh, Jan Milan and other things took over, that little intimate gathering was lost, but I met him off and on here and uh, in other social um, get togethers. But as Praveenji mentioned, he, in 19, in, um, in uh, five years back, when I established the chair, Jenny G, with his age and um, frail health, traveled from Berkeley to Davis and attended the ceremony. He was so supportive. Not only that, he stood up and he even talked for a little while, which was extempore because we weren't sure he'd be able to make it. And of course, it ended with a thunderous applause. So that is how I remember him, how he was able to reach out both in, to me in both scholarly way and as a person, which I will cherish, I will never be able to forget. So I know he will always be remembered by his scholarly work, uh, but he'll be sorely missed 
because there was so much more to be learned from him. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mohini. Now let's hear what Dr. Shugan Jain from India brings us from his treasure box of memories. Dr. Shugan Chan Jain, founder, chairman, and current president of International School for Jain Studies, well known as ISJS, worked as information and systems consultant director, entrepreneur during 1962 to 2002 in India, USA, and the Netherlands. Earned PhD in 2005, promoted ISJS to introduce academic studies of Jainism globally. Mr. Dr. Shugan Chanji Jain. Thank you. Judgment and good evening from Naval Virayatan, Pune. Professor P.C. Jain, P.S. Jaini, my hero. I always remember, I always revere Professor Jaini for his contributions to Jain studies. In 2001, when I decided to devote full time for Jain studies, I looked around for him. I was looking for somebody who could be my mentor and teacher for Jain philosophy. So, fortunately, I learned that he is coming to India to set up a Jain study center at Andhra University. But my joy was short-lived. So I went back to uh, Berkeley and I was told that he has retired from there since then. So all my hopes to be with him was shattered in the beginning itself, but I never gave up. And I decided to pursue my PhD degree elsewhere. In 2005, I started ISJS and always wanted Professor Jani to be its mentor and guide. You people in, North, in Northern California are lucky to have access to him. I was not so lucky. I tried all my means my, through my friends and through his email address, but he was never accessible. So I took the long route of sending my post, all our proceedings and the papers prepared by our young scholars. Finally, after two years, he sent me an email reply complimenting me for promoting young Jain scholars, a cadre of young Jain scholars who are writing good papers, not the best papers, but at least a beginning has been made. So I said, now here is my hero. So I immediately wrote back to him, thank you very much. Would you like to come to India? for a week and teach ISJS classes and me, because I want to be guided by a real Jain scholar. After a lot of discussions, he agreed to come for a fortnight with his wife and stay with me at my home. So here is my dream come to. He came, he stayed with us and for full three days, he taught the ISJS class, consisting of 35 members. And he told me, Shugan, this is the largest group of class I have taught in my life. In fact, the photo in the background you saw, you see here, is from that classroom itself. He was very happy and I was so was I. But the remaining 11 days which he was staying with me, I used maximum to gain knowledge at a personal level and guidance in how to, you know, promote Jain studies. I will give you some of his, you know, really meaningful and effective advice he gave me about Jain studies and ISJS. He said, number one, do not aim to produce too many PhDs in Jainism. Because at that time, Jain studies were not there. 
So you said you want to the whole world to be PhDs in journalism. What will they do after they have PhD? Then they will shout at you and say you have wasted our life. So I, I, the idea went to my mind, and I changed my strategy. That instead of creating PhDs, I said we will promote studies, so that we have a band of students who are well versed in Jain studies. And then he said, try to promote Jain studies in association with Buddhist studies, as he was. He said, because Buddhist studies are popular, so if you, you know, piggyback Jain studies, then they will get extra mileage. And I tried to implement that idea. Then for me, he said, focus on teaching and research on Jainism and minimize work related to fundraising and administration. He said, you cannot do all of them, otherwise you will lose track. And then the most important advice he gave me is, he said, ask the students to pay for their studies. Don't give them charities. They are rich people, they can afford. And whatever is given in free is not effective. They will come, have a good time, and then disappear. I tell you, this was the turning point in the history of ISJS. There I told Sulek Bhai, from next year, we don't need, you know, the kind of money you are giving to support this. Cut it by three fourths. And he was so happy that now he has funds, you know, to spend elsewhere. And it helped us also because students who came after paying, they were damn serious about the students. And they made my life and my faculty members' life, you know, difficult. And we learned in the process. Then the most important advice he gave me is, do not overexpose yourself to students. As they will publish derogatory stories about you when they grow back. I was not happy with this statement. So I said, Professor, we believe in giving experiential knowledge to Jain, uh, to students. Now, if I don't behave like a Jain, like I teach, what will they learn? So this is one advice which I did not pursue that he gave me. And I think it came very handy and a dis distinguishing, you know, or a, a strong point of highest stairs. And in the last, he said, yeah, he presented his entire set of publications to us. And also he gave me a, you know, a proof edition of his latest book. He said, Shogun, you read it and I want your comments. What should I do with this? Or is there room for exposure? And I said, I thought that is his way of appreciation. I tried to stay in touch with him, but you know, again, his a lifestyle did not permit me, and soon we lost contact with each other. But I am indeed today, till today, I am honored with what he taught me about Jainism, about Jain studies, and how to conduct the school. And I owe a lot of success of ISJS to his association with me. I pay my regards and homage to him. Thank you very much. Okay. Savita, yeah, I'm done. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. I just want to say ki Admi Musafir Ata hai jata Ate jate rasti me yaade chhod jata hai. Lekin ye yaade to aisi hai ki jo generation se generation ko hum aage se aage badhana chahenge. Ye jo dharohar Shri Padmanabh ji hamare saath chhod gaye hai. Wo unki yaad hamesha hume dilata rahega. 
हम वो हमेशा उन यादों के जरिए हमारे साथ रहेंगे सो थैंक यू सो मच फॉर दैट नेक्स्ट आई वुड लाइक टू इनवाइट श्री मनीष जी मोदी मिस्टर मनीष मोदी ग्रेट ग्रैंडसन एंड डिसेंडेंट ऑफ पंडित नथुराम प्रेमी जी रंस हिंदी ग्रंथालय अ पब्लिशिंग हाउस एंड पब्लिश्ड थ्री टाइटल्स बाय प्रोफेसर डॉक्टर पद्मनाभ जी जैनी क्रिस्टियनिटी एंड जैनिज्म एंड इंटरफेथ डायलॉग योगा योग एंड द जैन पाथ ऑफ प्यूरिफिकेशन प्लीज वेलकम मिस्टर मनीष जी मोदी जय जिनेन्द्र मोक्ष मार्ग से नेतारम भीतारम कर ज्ञातारम विश्व तत्व नाम बंदे तत्वन लगते हैं it's a great honor and a privilege to be here and in the company of such distinguished panelists and scholars and to be able to talk about professor dr padmanabh jaini sir uh mohini ji mentioned that she would address him as uh, jaini ji i once asked dr jaini how should i address him sir because we've been associated for five generations of a family i said you can just call me dr jaini Fine. I'll I, so I'll refer to him as Dr. Jain because that's how we spoke to each other. We really enjoyed a wonderful relationship of writing letters to each other. I met him for the first time when I organized his lecture at the Asiatic Society in Bombay, where Shubhanji was present. He spoke beautifully on uh, Christianity and Jainism and interfaith dialogue. And uh, then when I went to Berkeley, he held a dinner in my honor. It was lovely to meet him there again. and uh, over the years we had umpteen telephone calls and he would call 12 o'clock at night and then talk to me for like 2 hours but it was jaini sahab and he's been such a brilliant reporter it's always a pleasure to talk to him and to listen from him and he was a tremendous mentor and um, someone who was a sahriday gyan pe pasu dekhte he loved knowledge he loved sharing knowledge and he was so enthused by the work that we did and he would always tell me that uh, you know you come from this family you have to do all this kind of work because this is your karma and uh, to begin with when he was a very young lad he came to bombay and met my great grandfather pandit nathuram premi and premi ji mentored him and advised him that you should go and meet pandit sukla ji you want to continue your studies after your ma in sanskrit you want to study jainism further go and meet pandit sukla ji so jaini sahab would come to bombay and was with us at cp tank at the bookstore and he asked my great grandfather ke premi ji main kab jaun ke paas to premi ji said abhi chale jaun na koi baat nahi it's like 7 o'clock 7:30 in the after in the evening and we are about 1 km away from marine drive and so premi ji told jaini ji ke jao abhi chale jao wo mil jayenge so jaini ji had come with another friend from karnataka these both these tall dark young men these uh, tulu men you know they went running they went to marine drive and they reached uh, pandit sukla ji's home and there now pandit sukla ji must have retired by then so they had a servant you know pandit sukla ji was a pragya chakshu he could not see on his own and he had a man servant with him so the man servant opened the door and uh, jaini ji said hum pandit sukla ji se milne aaye hain and man servant said nahi abhi pandit ji so gaye hain tum jao so jaini sahab was very aware of the how the world works even as a young man so he said Loudly, मैं पंडित नाथुराम प्रेमी ने मुझे भेजा है मैं पंडित सुखलाल जी से मिलने आया हूं मैं एम ए संस्कृत हूं इमीजिएटली अंदर से पंडित सुखलाल जी कॉल्ड आउट सो एंड सो हुज गाय पंडित प्रेमी जी ने भेजा है अच्छा अच्छा अंदर भेजो सो इमीजिएटली पंडित प्रेमी जी रैंग बेल फॉर पंडित सुखलाल जी एम ए इन संस्कृत रैंग बेल फॉर पंडित सुखलाल जी एंड दैट्स हाउ जैनी साहब बिगैन इज जर्नी की मैट पंडित सुखलाल जी एट पी एम After 15 minutes, Pandit Suklal ji says, "Tumara saman kaha hai?" And uh, Jaini Sahab said, "My saman is with my friend. He's at Bombay Central. He said, 'Saman lekar aao. 10 baje ki train hai. We are going to Ahmedabad. Next two years, you'll be with me. I'll make sure you do your studies.'" And that's how it was. So spontaneously, at 8 p.m., he met him. He went running to Bombay Central, got his stuff. 10 baje ki raat, 10 10 p.m. ki train mein baith ke. Jaini Sahab went with Pandit Suklal ji and stayed in Ahmedabad for two years, learning Urdu Magadi and learning uh, Gujarati, mastering Gujarati by the way, and uh, mastering the Shatambara scriptures. 
and from there on moved on to Banaras and so on and so forth. So he told me this, you know, when he hosted dinner at my, in my owner in Berkeley, and I was like, Jenny Saab is so kind of you, it's so brilliant. He says, no, no, but this is the least I can do for you because this is that connection with you. So then we started talking. I published two books. The third will be out soon. So the first book was Christianity and Jainism, this dialogue he had with uh, on BBC with a British journalist. And the second book uh, that we did was Coincidences, Yoga Yoga, which is its memoirs. I published them in English and Marathi. The Hindi is ready with proofreading. And we hope to also do a Gujarati edition. And the third book, of course, that we're about to publish is The Jena Path of Purification. We've always connected with each other. He had lo lovely, wonderful talks with me and my son, who's 21 years old. So Samyak designed the cover for Yoga Yoga. And then once again, designed the cover for Yuga Yuga Marathi, and then the cover for Jena Path of Purification, which Jenny Saab approved, Christy Wiley approved, Dr. Arvind Jenny, Jenny Saab's son approved. And uh, obviously, we were all thrilled. And I'm looking forward to publish this book. And for me, Jenny Saab is, of course, he's an institution by himself. He's a great scholar, a great man, a great, absolutely brilliant orator. But he's more than that. He's an example of how one can be a layman and serve the cause of Jainism splendidly. For me, Jenny Saab's work is not, publishing is not merely my profession. It's part of my service to Jain Dharm. He, uh, what he wrote, what he taught to us, and how brilliant he was at mentoring us. I remember once one of the shlokas, which he liked very much, was the Vishapahar Stotra. And he once wrote to me, Manish Tumare Pardadane, Premiji translated Vishapahar Stotra beautifully from Sanskrit to Hindi. And the translation is so good that I prefer the Hindi to the Mul Sanskrit. And I said, that's brilliant. And then I would always send all my translations to Jenny. So I said, Manish Tumara Kam, you translated now from Sanskrit to English. And he saw my translation of Bhaktamba Stotra, Kalyana Mandir Stotra. And he was very pleased and very, um, very, um, can I say, uh, he was very delighted and he was like a mentor to me and very Ashirwa Diya Karte Thi Hamesha Ke Manish, Tum Baud Achha Kaam Karo Aage Karte Rho, Bacche Ko Bhi Sikhao Tum Loog Baud Achha Kaam Karo Please continue this work and to me, to get this kind of validation from such a profound scholar is an amazing, amazing thing. I cannot uh, um, um, end before telling you how beautifully for the past two and a half, three years Dr. Christy Wiley has been his Manasaputri. She was his uh, student for PhD. But what she did in terms of uh, past two or three years is incredible. All the books, Yoga Yoga, English Yoga, Yoga Marathi, Jena Path of Purification, everywhere we would talk to Jenny Saab through Christy. And Christy would run from one place to the other. She would meet Jenny Saab every week. I need proofs for this. I need photographs. I need this. I need his approval. She would take printouts, carry with him, get his approval, get his you know, uh, signatures, get his comments on it and send it back to us. But Jenny Saab by then was not uh, comfortable with emails. This is last two, three years. And had it not been for Christy, all this work would not have been done. So a very special thanks to Christy Wiley, who's been incredibly kind and incredibly generous with her time and efforts and all because of her devotion to Jenny Saab. And all of you here, Jena, and all the wonderful scholars who are present here. I know John Court is here, Christopher P. Chapel, Paul Dundas, Malini Balbi, Christy Wiley, uh, Peter Flugel, Ole Kwanstrom, Robert Zeidenboss, all of you great scholars are here, and I feel honored to be here, a part of this very august meeting, honoring the 90th birthday of Dr. Jaini, who will live on forever in our hearts. Jai Jaini Pranam. Thank you, Manishji, for sharing those beautiful memories. Thank you. I can see the spark on your face while you were speaking about Jainiji and getting Ashirwad from him. Thank you. Next up, we have, uh, I would like to invite Mr. Rajendra Prakash Ji Jain. Sri Rajendra Jain, a member of Motilal Banarsidas Publication House, which is a famous world over for books on Indology. And the publication is one of India's oldest surviving publishing house and the largest publisher of Indology books. Please welcome Sri Rajendra Prakash Ji Jain.
can you please unmute yourself rajendra ji it's a pleasure to be with all of you but i hardly feel barely feel that i could do pro proper justice by speaking about uh, padmanabh jaini ji who was such a profound scholar and an institution in himself we we, <clears throat> we have published three books of his and those books uh, have been well received all over the world the classic is jain path of purification which is a uh, which is considered as a classic in contemporary jainism jain studies and the other two books that we published are collected works of jain studies and collected works of buddhist studies so it has been a pleasure for us to get in touch with him <clears throat> and i came in contact with him in one of his lectures at india international center in new delhi i cannot say much more than uh, anything else about his uh, life but it is a pleasure to be to it was a pleasure to be with him and understand the great personality of dr jaini and as far as i remember his scholarship in india he had uh although i met him only once but at different places i i came to know that he had uh, uh spread a lot about jain studies as well as buddhist studies we would definitely like to publish more books of professor jaini if that is possible in the future and it will be our pleasure and a tribute to such a great scholar and his scholarship that's all thank you rajendra ji when professor jaini ji moved across the country from michigan to california he wrote we were now literally on the shore of the pacific ocean and it appears as if my train leaving nalikar mudbadri karanja nasik ahmedabad banaras london and ann arbor had now reached its terminal my final stop here in beautiful berkeley that was professor jaini's journey in search for knowledge please welcome dr sulek ji jain dr sulek ji jain past president of jaina chair of jaina academic liaison committee co-founder of international school for jain studies please welcome dr sulek ji jain जय 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 नमस्कार गुड मॉर्निंग गुड आफ्टरनून गुड इवनिंग टू ऑल पार्ट्स ऑफ द वर्ल्ड दिस सेमिनार दैट वी ऑर्गेनाइज्ड इज स्पेसिफिकली टाइटल्ड प्रोफेसर पी एस जैनी ए फ्रेंड एंड मेंटर मेनी मेनी स्पीकर्स बिफोर मी हैव स्पोकन अबाउट हिम हु न्यू हिम वेल as a friend or as a mentor uh, dr shugan jain with whom he stayed for many many for a couple of weeks he narrated his encounter with him 
before that uh, our own praveen bhai jain who gave a profound background about padmanab jaini ji and i want to specially thank savita ben i want to thank biran bhai who have been work, uh, working for the last 3 months day and night i have never seen anybody who is so meticulous and also shogun ji who inspired to organize this seminar so i am very grateful but they were able to share some of the remembrances of a ps jaini ji i just want to say the very first speaker in a way whose message was read by savita ji was swami charukirti bhattarak ji of uh, of uh, shravan bel gola swami ji has been when we approached him he had a mon breath for two months okay he wanted to send us a video of his talk but naturally because a mon breath he will not do that he did, could not do that but he was so gracious enough to send us his message so how grateful we are because these are the people who knew him very well as far as i am concerned i came to know him 1980 i met him several time in his office in berkeley i bought his book jain path of purification and at least read it two to three times and when you see berkeley they wanted to dispose of his books means sale i bought 12 copies maybe prem bhai jain alerted me and i bought 12 copies and gave it to many many of my friends i still have probably two or three copies one of them published by mlbd let me say here to rajendra bhai jain from mlbd yes you published uh, ps jaini's book but now we have many many scholars inspired by ps jaini and they will be writing books and we urge you we request you to take a strong look and please publish those works they will be coming they are already here so please encourage them now with that let me just share few my i did not know him as well as many of you have known but let me just share only few remembrances in 1990 there was a two days conference at harvard on jainism which i attended at that time i happened to be the president of jaina and professor jaini and many many speakers they gave beautiful talk for two days i had never seen before a conference like this on jainism anywhere in the western world so for me it was a great opportunity since in many jain from boston jain center could not attend his seminar during the day they asked professor jaini and all the attendees to come to the boston jain center in the evening to a host seminar and they will provide the dinner so all of them came and professor jaini ji spoke professor jaini ji there spoke and i just want to remind you one profound especially biran bhai prem ji and many of us because we've been here for many many years he gave a very profound prediction and that prediction was and probably may, many of you may not remember but i do he said that thousands of years of jain sang history tells him that as the jain population will increase in north america and consequently many jain pracharaks sadhus bhattaraks and other followers will come here they will all bring their own brand of jainism all over from india and you all see the same sectarianism and disunity here to as in india so he advised jaina and specifically at that time since i happen to lead jaina and all the jain leaders that be careful be vigilant okay this is something i still remember how vividly how clearly he said that so my brothers and sisters in spite of the efforts of many of the jain visionary leaders here some of them are here unfortunately and i want to be very plain i am now seeing several examples of the same thing happening here that jainism was afraid of so we have to really take stock and we need to empire admire his frankness admire his vision 40 years ago in 1991 this already parveen bhai jain mentioned 
there was a Jena convention at Stanford and Janiji was there for full three days. He did not go home. And when he did go home, he got a shock. He got a shock that his only daughter, Asha Jain, she met with an accident and she had died while Janiji was still at the Jena convention. What a tremendous 32 year old. What a shock that will be to any person when you go home and found out that his daughter and oh, his daughter died two or three days ago. But as a philosopher, as a practitioner of Jain values, he was absolutely calm and quiet, and he was able to overcome that shock, which many of us may not be. About 15 years ago, uh, we had started a program what we call meet and greet with the Jain scholars. And whenever there will be, there was a American Academy of Religions and Dhanam, they will have a convention which they have every year. We will meet with many, many hundreds of Jain scholars or academics so that we can interest them to work on Jain values and Jain uh, academics. So that year, I don't remember exactly, maybe 15 years ago, Prem Bhai might remember, we arranged that because the convention that year was in downtown San Francisco. So Prem Bhai, we arranged a meet and greet dinner and Professor Christopher Chappell was there and our request Professor Christopher Chappell invited Professor Jenny B to be the main key, key, keynote speaker. It was in the evening, probably 200 people were there and it was a dinner meeting and Professor Jenny G spoke so clearly about Jain Ramayana. And he probably had never heard of the beauty of the Jain Ramayana. By the way, there are 350 different versions of the Ramayans in India. And there are eight different versions of Jain Ramayana too. So, but the character of Bhagwan Ram as, as described in Jain Ramayana is so superb. He is the embodiment of unconditional ahimsa. He did not kill Ramana, okay, according to Jain Ramana. Because if somebody kills, then it becomes a problem. It is not ahimsa. So I first time I came to know the differences from Padmanabh Jainiji in his very beautiful talk about uh, uh, the differences between Jain Ramana and Arya as a Ramana. Now, coming back last year, Jaina published a 148-page special issue of Jain Digest on the progress, on the evolution of the Jain academic education in North America. And my brothers and sisters, if you don't have a copy of that, it is available free. You can go on Jaina website, download it. It is a, I would say, collector's item. So there, I requested Dr. Nitin Shah, who is here, is the vice chair of Jaina Academic Liaison Committee to approach Professor Padnab Jainiji to write a forward to that 148 page Jain Digest, which beautifully he did. He led us through the journey, how Jain academic education grew and started. And some of these things he said, when he came to Berkeley in 1972. Berkeley, by the way, in 1969, I was a postdoc fellow at Berkeley, but in mechanical engineering. But when he said in 1972, when Professor Janiji came to Berkeley to teach, no one there had ever taught Jainism before him, nobody. And to, he said to his surprise, never even heard of it many people did not know what Jainism or Jain spellings are. That was the case in 1972. So, Herman Jacobi in 1884, Virchand Raghavji Gandhi in, 19, in, in 1893, and Professor Jaini in last 50 years, put Jainism known in the world and put Jainism on the world's religious map. It's a great, great contribution. Janiji was an institution and many scholars from around the world and particularly from India made a kind of pilgrimage. If, an, if America, one is looking for a Jain pilgrimage, it was Professor Janiji. 
they will go to berkeley and meet with him and he will spend time so truly in my opinion professor jaini ji was a grand yogi and the jain sang is grateful to him even in his last message he said the message that he wrote down for jain digest okay what he said at this juncture in the future of jain studies i believe i believe means professor jaini said it would be best to support fellowship to students to students of indian religion and culture to study jainism in india and abroad and if professor jaini ji were here today if you are alive and we were still celebrating his 98 birthday i would say jaini ji well this is what jain community is doing right now with 30 nearly 30 chairs professorships fellowships and many other things that are happening and more will be happening especially the very first that professor uh, uh, mohini jain ji started at at uh, uh, uc davis so we are fulfilling his dream so let me just very quickly pay my tribute to him jism fani humne tera nazar e aatish kar diya i know savita ji you are far better 100 times better than i am jism fani humne tera nazar e aatish kar diya chal jaane wale ye te aagaaz ka anzam hai chal diya duniya se tu humko akela chhod kar de tere charno mein ab apna aakhri pranam hai what it says oh departed soul we have already offered your mortal body to fire this is the end result of each creation or birth you left this world leaving us alone we offer our salutation respect and namaskar to you padnam jaini ji jay jirandar namaskar thank you so much sulek uncle ji and the whole panel all the panelists for uh, sharing such beautiful memories with us today thank you so much prabhnanab ji jaini a friend a mentor thank you i would now like to invite mr prem ji jain he is a well known uh, philanthropist a generous donor of his time knowledge and wealth founding member and past president of jaina and most recently a 2021 recipient of jaina ratna award jcnc founding member please welcome mr prem ji jain jai hey, jinender sarita ben and thank you thank you for a kind introduction a lot of being said about uh, professor padmanab jaini and uh, i would like to say my interaction with him over the last uh, you know almost 45 years uh, since i came to this country uh he was really a renowned scholar of jain studies as well as buddhist studies so some of the things may be repeat but i will try to cover it my interaction with him through those uh, time frame professor padmanabh jami came to berkeley in 72 from university of michigan like talked about before joined uc berkeley as a professor of buddhist studies in the department of southeast asian studies i first met professor jani or what we all refer to him as jani ji uh, and his family at a social get together when i arrived in california in 1975 as he continued to meet after his first encounter i came to understand that he is a world leading authority on both buddhism and jainism He told us stories about receiving formal training on Jain studies from his guru Pandit Shukla Ji, which is we heard quite a bit about it. Which he was exposed to sectarian issue within the community, and you heard from Praveen uh, by talking about how he was so much interested in making it sure that we don't bring that sectarianism from India to here. And so far, you know, we are very successful, but we need to be even more careful to make sure we can we can preserve our unity. in this country as as we continue to meet uh he told me multiple things that uh, his deep knowledge on rituals as well as history of the religion including not only jainism buddhism hinduism sikhism islam and christianity to me it was very important and fascinating that whenever we discuss whether it is a political discussion whether it is a family discussions whether it is a social discussion whether it is a cultural religious discussion jani ji was always there to provide factual data and a history lessons 
on any topic we discussed among friends, families in get together. Around the same time in 1975, like mentioned by Praveen Bhai, Acharya Shishil Muniji came here to US, stayed at Professor Jainiji's house and Shashiji's house with the blessing of Guruji, Professor Jaini, my uncle, Dr. Shantilal Mutha, Professor Subodh Jain, who you're going to hear a little bit, Dr. Nemi Chan Jain, and myself and other prominent Jain residents of Greater Bay Area founded Jain Milan, a meeting place for local Jains. That's the meaning of Jain Milan. This was a non-sectarian Jain organization of the San Francisco extended Bay Area, and, and including Davis, uh, and in 1991, we formally incorporated as JCNC, Gen Center of Northern California. Janiji was our scholar, as well as mentor for celebrating Mahavir Janti, Diwali, and many other occasions. I fondly remember when Professor Jani, Sashiji, Arvind, Asha hosted our first picnic at Tilden Park in Berkeley, close to their family residence. And this was the start of something very special for the local Jain community. And it was all organized by him actually in this uh, Tilden Park. It was very clear early on that Jainiji would have lasting impact on Jainism both around the world as well as in the greater Bay Area. He published his book, Jaina Path of Purification in 1977 by, in, by uh, UC Berkeley Press. And I was privileged to go to India on his behalf to collect various illustrations for his book. When Jena was established in 1981, Professor Jenny was the part of delegation from JCNC and was also a scholar speaker on Jain studies at the event. Professor Jenny contributed shaping the Jain declaration on nature, which was published at the Jena convention in 1991. Additionally, at the convention, Janiji was chairperson for scholar sessions, committees, led many sessions, including youth workshop, history of Jainism, ecology, ahimsa, and many others. Also, in 1981, he was a part of the delegation which we took it to LA, where the Jaina was formed. And he was a keynote speaker also on the first Jaina convention in LA in 1991. Unfortunately, after the convention was over in Bay Area, he received some shocking news, which I think uh, we heard from uh, Sulek Bhai. Devastating news, Asha Janiji's daughter passed away suddenly, and it was a big loss to our community as a part of our extended family, was taken away from us so soon. In search for his answer, Janiji dove even deeper into Jainism and Buddhist studies. He played an important role as a member of the advisory board for Ahimsa Center at Cal, Cal Poly Pomona participated in numerous conferences for the Ahimsa Center since the, since the inception in 2004. Over the years, I had many opportunities to drive him from the Bay Area to Cal Poly, other places, and had the privilege to continuously learn from him on those long drives at the breakfast tables or our morning walks. He was always ready to share and impart wisdom to others and it's a gift that I'll, I will always cherish with me. A few weeks before Janiji left, he requested that the best way to tribute him would be by celebrating his life journey, which is what we are doing it today. I'm very grateful for Arvind to provide a lot of information, a lot of videos, and uh, you know, which you're gonna see it, part of it, uh, and his family to continuously uh, supporting all the causes of the Jain community in Bay Area and other places. We are so grateful to Professor Jaini that he has documented much of his knowledge in resources that we have learned, from, we, can, we can learn from them and share it. Whether it is published papers or his PBS video on Ahimsa, his books, keynote sessions, other forms of media, we are blessed that we have been left with a trove of information on Jainism, Buddhist studies and others. Let's all work together to make sure we take his work to the next level. Om Shanti, Jai Jinnin. Thank you, Prem Ji.
Thank you so much for sharing those memories. Now, आप में से कई लोग जैनी जी के काफी क्लोज रहे हैं उनसे काफी कुछ सीखा है आप लोगों ने आई वॉज जस्ट वंडरिंग वॉज देर एनी पर्टिकुलर भजन और प्रेयर और अ सॉन्ग दैट जैनी जी यूज टू और लाइक टू हम और सिंग वाइल वर्किंग और टीचिंग यू कैन राइट इट इन द चैट I would love to sing two lines of that bhajan or or of that prayer. I will wait for a minute. Otherwise, um, I know we are celebrating his life, but since he left us for the heavenly abode, I would like to give Shraddhanjali to these two lines of, of bhajans to Professor Jaini Ji. जैन धर्म के तुम थे गौरव कहाँ चले गए जैन धर्म के तुम थे गौरव कहाँ चले गए सेवा समर पण सेवा समर पण सदभावनाए सिखा के चले गए जैन धर्म के तुम थे गौरव कहा चले गए एक पुष्प था बाग का कलिया खिली आने कलिया खिली आने उन्होंने अपने ज्ञान को केवल अपने तक सीमित नहीं रखा बल्कि बस वो बांटते गए बांटते गए एक पुष्प था बाग का कलिया खिली अने कलिया खिली अने कलियों ने गुण सुर भी डाली कुल बनेंगे अने कुल बनेंगे अने माता पिता माता पिता गुरु का प्रेम दे गए जिन शासन के तुम थे गौरव कहा चले गए जिन शासन के तुम थे गौरव कहा चले गए भावपूर्ण श्रद्धांजलि टू प्रोफेसर श्री पद्मनाभ जी जैनी विथ दैट लेट स्टार्ट अवर नेक्स्ट पैनल लेट बाय श्री तारा सेठिया जी Taraji Sethiya Shri Shantinath Endor Chair in Ahimsa Studies and Professor of History at California State Polytechnic University Pomona As the founder and director of the Ahimsa Center on campus she led the establishment of a degree program for a minor in nonviolent studies and serves as its advisor and coordinator She has directed centers national and residential biennial summer institutes for kindergarten to 12th leadership in non-violence education. Please don't do anything. She received a PhD in history from UCLA. Her authored edited books include Ahimsa Anekan and Jainism. Gandhi pioneer of nonviolent social change and living gandhi please welcome tara ji sethiya and her panel professor jaini ji as an advisor and mentor jai jinendra i hope my panelists will be joining me here 
Um, but while they join, I'll start. Um, I met Professor Jenny for the first time in 2001 when we were planning to host a conference, Ahimsa Anekant and Jainism on our campus to celebrate the 26th birth centenary of Lord Mahavira, which we did in January of 2002. And I met Professor Jenny at UC Berkeley um, in the summer of 2001, extending him this invitation to grace this conference. And he graciously agreed to be the concluding key speaker for the conference, which featured many scholars of Jainism from here and abroad. And some of them are present at this event today. Since 2002, I had the privilege of learning from Professor Jenny and seeking his advice on numerous occasions. In the process, what really struck me over these last two decades were some of his personal qualities, especially his way of encouraging good work. I share an example of this from January of 2002, following the conference, which we hosted on our campus. The week after the conference, I received a note from Dr. Bob Suzuki, who was our university president at that time, along with a letter Professor Jenny had written to Suzuki, complimenting him for supporting the conference, Ahimsa Anekant and Jainism. He concluded this letter and I quote him, I had the privilege of summarizing the papers and giving a response at the end. It would be no exaggeration to say that this is by far one of the best conferences on such a theme, unquote. Professor Jenny never sent me a copy of this letter, but the way he wrote it, he knew the letter will get to me. It was his way of appreciating and thereby encouraging the institutional support which is so essential for such undertakings. As my interaction with him grew over the years since then, it became clear to me that he regarded this as part of his professional ethic to encourage any good work he saw anywhere. A year and a half later, in 2003, 2004, when the Ahimsa Center was launched on our campus, he did the same thing with the Jain community. In his remarks at the inauguration of the center in 2004, he commended all the stakeholders uh, for their contribution, but he had special words for the Jain community who had hitherto confined its philanthropic activities to temple buildings. He was delighted to see a point of departure from that trend and had many laudatory remarks for those members of the Jain community who had invested in education about Ahimsa on our campus. Professor Jenny had a unique place and role at the Ahimsa Center, as Rainbhai just mentioned. He was a key member of Center's advisory board. Through his ideas and advice, he inspired many of the initiatives of the Center. He had the privilege, we had the privilege of hosting him and his wife on our campus where Professor Jenny spoke at several Ahimsa conferences. And these visits were important because they reinforced his trust and confidence in the center's activities. Later, when he was retiring from UC Berkeley, he decided to gift the entire collection of his books, including rare books in his field to Cal Poly Pomona. And we are honored that these are housed as P.S. Jenny collection in our library, which shares borrowing privileges with libraries in 23 campuses within the California State University System and the University of California System. The words that come to mind as I reflect on Professor Jenny's legacy in the role of an advisor and mentor are wisdom, generosity, accessibility, and humility. Professor Jenny was a giant in the field of both Jain studies and Buddhist studies, but more importantly, he was a man of wisdom. 
with deep knowledge of Jain and Buddhist scriptures, as well as the history of scholarships in these fields going back to several centuries. He was a man of extraordinary experiences or coincidences, as he would like to say, rising from very modest background to becoming a towering figure in these fields. He wrote in accessible style, communicating complex concepts and ideas in clear and simple manner. Like his scholarship, Professor Jenny was also accessible. He readily made himself available for conversations and was generous in many ways. He was generous with his time, with his ideas and his advice. Although he had stopped traveling in the last few years, he made himself available by phone for in-person meetings and always took joy in meeting and never rushed. Over the years, he provided many welcoming opportunities for meeting at his home, on our campus, and at our home. And in every in-person meeting, he also made sure to give me a book, a paper, or a photo, or something. The first gift that I got was when he visited our home following the conference in 2002, he brought us the autographed copy of his most popular book, The Jaina Path of Purification. And inscribed there was a long message, but there was an important aphorism. Padmam nanam tau daya, first mm -hmm. knowledge, then compassion. Another time he gave me two framed portraits of Srimad Raj Chandra. More recently, he gave me a video of Acharya Tulsi uh, and his sermons, along with a few of his booklets. Sitting with him was a real treat, and every meeting was a learning experience. My last meeting was in November 2019 at his home in Berkeley, soon after the release of his memoir, Yoga Yog. Having read this, I expressed my sense of awe and admiration. In his typical self-effacing manner, he said, quoting from the Tatvart Sutra, Parasparo Groho Jivanam, that is, souls render services to one another. An aphorism he had fully embraced and hence the title of his memoir. When I called him last year to wish him on his 97th birthday, he sounded very upbeat, was very delighted and said, oh, he remembered. And was still talking about his intellectual engagement. We had a good conversation of nearly half an hour. I will miss him very much, but one, you know, one of his qualities, great humility is something that will continue to inspire me and perhaps others as well. Thank you so much. And I would now like to invite our next panelist, Dr. Christy Wiley. Christy Wiley is a scholar of Jainism. She did her PhD under Professor Jenny at UC Berkeley, where she also taught courses in Sanskrit and in Indian religions in the Department of South and Southeast Asian Studies. She's the author of Historical Dictionary of Jainism and several articles on various aspects of Jainism related to karma theory. She's also the co-editor of Brill's Encyclopedia of Jainism along with Paul Dundas, um, Jacobson and John Cole. Please welcome Dr. Christy Wiley. Thank you, Tara. Can everyone hear me? Hopefully I am unmuted and people are hearing me. So yes. Thank you, good. Thank you, Tara, very much for inviting me to be part of this panel and for Jaina and the Jain Center of California for this wonderful celebration of Professor Jaini's life on his, uh, what would have been his 98th birthday. So I'm part of the panel that's discussing Professor Jaini's role and that's how I always referred to him. So that's how I will refer to him today <clears throat> as an advisor and a mentor, in other words, as a teacher and a guide. 
It goes without saying that my academic life was profoundly impacted by Professor Jaini. However, for most of his career at Berkeley, one should remember that he served as a mentor to graduate students in the group in Buddhist studies, um, which, as mentioned earlier, which he had established along with Professor Lewis Lancaster within a year or so after his coming to Berkeley in 1972. Now, I did not meet Professor Jaini until years after this, sometime in the mid 1980s, when I was a student in the Department of South and Southeast Asian Studies, eventually becoming his research assistant. After deciding to focus on Jaina studies and to write my dissertation on the Agathya Karmas and the process of death and rebirth, he became one of my dissertation advisors. And to the best of my knowledge, this was the only Jaina studies dissertation that he ever supervised. So what are some of the qualities that made Professor Jaini such an outstanding mentor to myself and to a number of other students as well. <clears throat> what first comes to mind is the depth and breadth of his knowledge. As it relates to Jaina studies, this knowledge of both the Digumbra and Shwetambra traditions was quite in depth. No doubt, this is associated with his being born into a Jaina family and to being educated in Jain gurukuls, as mentioned earlier. It also, also relates to the way his life unfolded and what he saw as a series of coincidences that he so beautifully described in his memoirs. With the time that he spent in Gujarat, as well as his association with Samantha Bhadra Maharaj and Pandit Sukla Sanghavi Ji, among others. Coupled with this knowledge, however, was his ability to explain difficult and complex subject matter with ease. This ability, I believe, is related to his clarity of thought. It was this clarity of thought, as well as his attention to details and his insight into complex topics that made him well suited to critique one's writing. He was demanding in a positive sense and would insist that the final draft of whatever was written would be well organized and would present a detailed examination of every conceivable aspect of a topic. Another quality that comes to mind was his curiosity and a realization on his part that there was always more to learn. Perhaps this is why he enjoyed working with graduate students and was always very generous with his time. He did not seem to mind spending hours and hours reading with me, even in texts that would be quite technical and quite complex and not his, maybe his first choice of what he was wanting to learn about. He would readily admit it when he was not totally familiar with a given topic or the meaning of some obscure technical term or when he was not quite sure what a certain commentator was talking about. However, it was my experience that he would usually be on the right track and would immediately know where to look for further details, pulling, for example, Jayendra Siddhartha Kosha off the shelf or leafing through commentaries of the Tathagata Sutra or telling me where to begin to look in any number of texts. From a slightly different perspective, Professor Jaini has also served as a mentor to generations of scholars by interacting with them at conferences or by meeting with them in person when they came to Berkeley. He was always eager to learn about what everyone was working on and encouraged each of us to continue our research and to branch out into new topics that he believed needed more attention. I have no idea how many times he must have said to me, and I heard him say to others as well, you really ought to write on such and such, or, you know, no one has written on this. So there is no doubt that Professor Jaini had the qualities of a good mentor. He took a personal interest in everyone's scholarship. He was able to give constructive feedback. He valued a diversity of perspectives, and he was eager to learn. He certainly was eager to share his skills, knowledge, and expertise with others, and was enthusiastic about the growth of Jaina studies. Of course, it goes without saying that he was very successful in his own career. There is, however, one characteristic of a good mentor that Professor Jaini actually lacked. Anyone who has had conversations with Professor Jaini, either in person or on the phone, would acknowledge that he is not necessarily a good listener and was often really hard to get a word in edgewise. 
But this is not because he was uninterested in what you had to say. Rather, it relates to his other qualities of his eagerness to share his knowledge with others and the years that he spent standing in front of his students giving fascinating lectures without any notes whatsoever. Now, I mentioned this in conclusion because of the fact that, uh, as Manish Modi brought up uh, a little bit earlier, uh, in the last few years after Professor Jaini was no longer going to uh, campus, he did not have access to email. And so for this reason, I informally resumed my uh, duty as his research assistant. But it was actually done in the old fashioned way, and it worked very well. In, in particular with his communications with uh, Manish Modi across continents. So Manish would email me something, a, a PDF of something. It was easy for me to print out. I would take it to the post office and mail it to Professor Jaini. In fact, I live some two hours or so away from Berkeley. And so this worked to be a very efficient way along with telephone to be able to continue his communications. So it was a real privilege for me to be able to, uh, to assume this role again in the final years of his life and to be able to assist him to continue his work until the very end. So thank you very much. And I'm very interested to hear what other uh, panelists have to say about their perspectives as, with Professor Jaini as a mentor. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christy. Uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Shivani Bhotra, who is Bhagwan Mahavir and Chao Family Foundation host postdoctoral fellow in Gen Studies at Rice University. Prior to this, she was a lecturer in Gen Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Her research relates to Gen communities in India and abroad with a focus on themes such as migration, religious education, and gender roles. She is currently joining us from Jaipur, India. Please welcome Dr. Shivani Potra. Thank you, Taraji, for this opportunity uh, and organizing such a wonderful event. Without further detail, delay, I will start with my ex uh, expression. Professor Padmanabh Jaini never losing sight of academics. Professor Jaini was an Indian origin polymath, Buddhist, Jainist, professor, mentor, and advisor to his acquaintances. My first encounter with him was in June 2009 in Jaipur at a lecture delivered by him that literally went above my head. Yet his three day stay in Jaipur had a lasting impression that compels me to share my memories. The first meeting coincided with my birthday. My husband and I offered Professor Jenny a tour of the Pink City. Although he was very reluctant after a long tiring journey, he considered to his wife's wishes. Spending three hours with him and his wife in the car was the beginning of our interactions with Professor Jaini. We noticed that his feet were covered with blisters, which were unbearable to his body, but untouched to his soul. Without expressing any pain, he talked endlessly and enthusiastically. He posed multiple questions to me that I had no answers then, but they steered my thought process such that it turned out to be my birthday into academics. I shared three experiences with Professor Jaini that remain indelible in my mind. The first was about getting to know the reasons for the blisters. Mrs. Jaini told us that Professor Jaini behaved like a youth in his mid eighties. He walked barefoot with 25 other university students on a peak summer day. Professor Jaini was driven to provide the students a religious experience of a real Jain pilgrimage. Walking barefoot as pilgrims do was mainly to encourage students to look for joy rising above physical discomforts. Such an exchange transcends the boundaries of knowledge in classrooms, but emphasizes what is truly experiential education. The second memory was at his home in Berkeley. I was fortunate to be invited in, uh, to his home after completing my master's in religious studies from Florida International University. Having spent the first half of the day with Mrs. Jenny, 
the second and third part with Professor Jenny in his office at the university, we reached his home by dinner time. I was amazed to see such a rich spread of homemade Indian snacks, starters, main course, desserts, all served in a large traditional Indian plate called thali. Seeing my puzzled look, Professor Jenny declared, we are celebrating your post-convocation ceremony. I was further startled by the fact that while Mrs. Jenny prepared each item with love, Professor Jenny undertook all the cleaning, placing the dishes in the dishwasher and clearing the kitchen counter. When I offered help, Professor Jenny said, this was his modest contribution to the evening. This illustrates another dimension to his many-sided literary activities. The third experience is drawn from my last telephone conversation with Professor Jenny. I sought his advice. Is it going to be useful for me to learn Brahmi script? His answer was, was not a straight no, but in a frustrated voice, he said, Brahmi script is of no use to you at all. Whosoever thinks that Brahmi script is necessary is living in 100 years earlier times. Brahmi script has nothing to do with your research. This shows that how closely he, he knew, uh, he was so true with his opinion, frank with his uh, views, and how closely he knew uh, his, uh, his students. Actually, uh, Professor Jenny, uh, I would sometimes uh, switch over and call him uncle or Professor Jenny. So I had both kind of interaction and relation with him. Lastly, he told me, perfection is the enemy of good. This piece of advice was to actually convert my dissertation into a book soonest. His last sentence was a couplet from Kabir. Kal kare so aaj kar, aaj kare so ab. Pal mein parle hoye gi bahuri karega kab. What you want to do tomorrow, do it right now. There may be a holocaust in a moment. In that case, what will you do? When will you do? It is a coincidence that we lost Professor Jenny three days after I had lost my beloved husband, late Sanjeev Putra. Their last conversation was focused on the publication of my PhD dissertation into a book. May their souls rest in peace and they continue to transmit strength and courage to pursue the academic goals which they inspired me to achieve. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shivani, for sharing your insights. Um, let me now introduce our next panelist, Dr. Claire Mays. Dr. Mays is a scholar of South Asian religions and languages. She's a junior professor at the Department of Indology at the University of Tübingen in Germany. Prior to this, Dr. Mays was a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Texas at Austin, where she taught Jainism, Buddhism, and Sanskrit, among other South Asian topics. Her areas of research include nonviolence, death and dying, among others. She's currently working on a monograph that examines the Jain practice of fasting. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Claire. Nice. Jay Janindra, and thank you, Taraji, for the introduction. So good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, depending in which uh, time zone you are. Um, I'm both honored and as well humbled to be part of this panel that is commemorating Professor Jamie as a mentor, advisor, and person. While Professor Jaini's scholarship has been important for my own work on early Jainism and Buddhism, I will not be talking about his scholarship, um, as some of you already mentioned uh, about his work, and as well because it will be talked about in the two upcoming panels uh, moderated by Professor John Court. So instead, I will be sharing a few personal memories of Professor Jaini. And my presentation is entitled, 
Time wounds all heals, and heals is spelled with double E. I learned about the passing of Professor Dr. Padmanap S. Jaini when I just came out of a 10 day Vipassana retreat. It was one of the first emails I read and it touched me deeply. I instantly recalled the last time we spoke when, we, when he had talked about his views on life after death. At one point, he suggested he may come back in raindrops. In Tübingen, where I now live, it's been raining much lately. Professor Jaini left a unique impact on me. As Savita Jainiji uh, mentioned earlier, uh, Professor Jainiji touched many lives, including me. He not only changed the way I sometimes think about the rain, um, for me, he was also an academic role model. I admired him both for his scholarship and personality. So in honor of Professor Jainiji's memory, I would like to recount a few moments I shared with him that illustrate well, I believe, his gentle, caring, witty, and generous character. He was also respectful to the point that he burned his feet, literally. So I will be referring back to the blisters uh, that Shivani was mentioning. So in the summer of 2009, uh, Professor Jaini was one of the principal instructors of the International Summer School for Jain Studies, for which I have to thank Tugun Jainji, who did not give up on inviting him, as he was mentioned earlier, as he mentioned earlier. I was a participating student, having just begun my PhD research. As part of the program, we visited Gwalior to see the historic rock cut caves with the monumental Tirtankara carvings. Out of respect for the sites, Professor Jaini insisted on climbing the hill barefoot. I was wearing socks, but despite this extra layer of protection, I soon felt the heat of the rocks. It was late morning and the sun already had a few good hours to turn the rocks into burning coals. Somewhere midway up the hill, another student, Ellen Goh, and I insisted that he would also put socks on to protect, to protect his feet. When he finally agreed, unfortunately it was too late. His feet were burned and they were burned severely. Namely, these are the blisters uh, that Shivani was mentioning. In an email exchange a few weeks after the program, Professor Jaini reflected amusingly on this event. I share an extract of his email, and though it's short, it shows his sense of humor and love for witty wordplay. I quote, my pilgrimage will remain memorable for my bold climb up the hill in the heat and meeting there with two obliging insurance agents helping me to walk. I remember saying, time wounds all heals. Well, I am much better now. I can walk, but it will be months before I can jog. Time heals all wounds, indeed, end quote. Fast forward a few years later. In February, 2017, I spent an unforgettable afternoon with Professor Jaini at his office at UC Berkeley. We talked for many long hours and as time flew by and we got hungry, he brought out his lunchbox. In a gesture of utter kindness, he cut his sandwich in half and shared it. I ate countless of sandwiches in my life. I hardly recall any of them, but till this day, I vividly remember this sandwich. Given Professor Jaini's background, I was not surprised to see that it was vegetarian. What struck me, however, was the simplicity of the sandwich. Two slices of white bread holding together some lettuce and cucumber. If we are what we eat, then Professor Jaini embodied ahimsa to a degree I had rarely seen before. At that time, I was working on a paper that examined the practice of nakedness as a marker of ascetic identity in early India. Professor Jaini had addressed this subject in several of his publications. In Jain Sectarian Debates, uh, published in 2008, he shows, for instance, how throughout the centuries, the question of clothed versus unclothed asceticism has been a central point of dispute between Shvetambaras and Digambaras. While talking about this topic, Professor Jaini, in another generous gesture, 
gave me his Xerox copy of the Yukti Prabodha, a 17th century Shvetambara text composed by Upadhyaya Megavijaya, centered on the refutation of the Neodigambara sect of Banarsidas. The copy is dotted with his handwritten notes and markups. When I look at the text and when it's raining, I am reminded of my afternoon with Professor Janey at UC Berkeley, and I feel that my conversation with him did not end there, but is still continuing, for which I am grateful for. So Professor Janey, thank you, and Jane Janindra. Thank you, Claire, for those sharing those wonderful experiences. Uh, it is with great pleasure now, I introduce our final panelist, Dr. Srinivas Reddy. Uh, Dr. Reddy is an author, translator, scholar, and musician. He received his PhD in classical South Asian languages and literature at UC Berkeley, and currently teaches at Brown University, and also at the Indian Institute of Technology in Gandhinagar. His book, Krishna Dev Raya of Vijayanagara, was published uh, very recently, just last year. He has performed sitar concerts around the world. And as part of his tribute to Professor Jenny, he will also play sitar for us at this event. But before I give uh, him the floor, I, since I will not come back at the end of the panel, I want to thank all the organizers for giving us this opportunity to share our experiences with Professor Jenny. And I also want to uh, uh, thank our host Savita Ji for uh, this wonderful uh, way of uh, bringing all the speakers. So thank you Savita Ji. And I want to announce that in the chat, I am putting uh, the URL for Ahimsa Center's special issue dedicated to Professor Jenny. So please make take a note of that and save that information. You will find that several scholars and members of the community have contributed to this special uh, edition of the Ahimsa Center's newsletter. Um, so with that, uh, Srini, the floor is yours. And thank you so much for agreeing to do this extended presentation and bring all your talents to play in dedication to your memories of uh, Professor Jen. Thank you. Thank you. Oh my gosh, I'm like really overwhelmed. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, it's, it's not easy to talk about someone who is, you know, not only a teacher and a friend, but like a part of the family. And um, I had a very deep and intimate relationship with Professor. Uh, that's what I call him, Professor. Uh, but uh, as we all know, he was a remarkable man. Um, and I have so many stories that I want to share. Uh, just one thing as our relationship grew, like Christy, I was also his research assistant. And in that role, you kind of get to know someone uh, closely, but we were working as his research assistants until the very end. Uh, I mean, Professor was incredibly pro prolific and uh, his most recent publication just came out uh, a few months ago. Um, but what I wanted to say was that he had a, a, a love of life. Um, as much as the, the Jaina life is about tiag uh, and, and renunciation and uh, simplicity, which he had, he also had an incredible love of food and music and jokes. If you, if you knew him closely, you knew the kind of humor he loved to share. Um, so uh, I could say so many things, uh, but one, one just thing that I wanted to, to say that I feel so privileged about in my life, uh, this intimacy is that during COVID, I spoke to Professor Janey every single day for one hour. So imagine like 365 hours of just fun discussion with the master. I mean, that's what I got in this life. I mean, I really feel like that was my greatest blessing is just having that 
closeness with him. And uh, if you spend time at home with him also, you know that um, he loved music, classical music, raga music of North India and South India, uh, uh, bhajans, all sorts of music. Um, so he had a, a, a rich sense of life. Um, so I, I could go on and on, of course, um, for the love that I have for this human being and what they meant to my uh, growth as a scholar and as a human being are inestimable. Um, so I will offer a type of Swaranjali, Sangeetanjali uh, to my guru. Um, but before that, I thought, and this is what I usually do, is this is, would be like a little vishrama for all of us. And, and I'll probably end a little earlier than we want so we can try to keep things on a good schedule because um, it is long to, to, to be together. But just to take this time to, to remember pr Professor, <clears throat> uh, two minutes of silence. And this bell actually that I use every day uh, was a gift from Professor, but it was actually Shashianti's bell. So uh, it's a beautiful thing that I remember every day. So here we'll have Dominic Shanti and then I'll tune and play. Okay, thank you very much. Hey, thank you so much. Um, so that reminds me, uh, you know, Professor loved quoting verses, you know, from all sorts of languages and all time periods. Uh, so that one just reminded me, sitting in silence, Maunyam Sarvarta Sadhanam. He used to tell me that all the time, probably because if I was chit chatting too much <laughs> to be quiet, silence will achieve all your ends or your purposes or goals. Um, so on that note, um, I will tune, this is the sitar. I'll be playing a Hindustani raga called uh, <clears throat> Madhuvanti and uh, short Alap Joranjala. And uh, thank you again to Dadaji, the panelists, organizers, Savita Madam for also singing, beautiful voice. And uh, music is, of course is a beautiful thing to have in life. It uh, can speak many things beyond what words can, as we know. So Rag Madhuanti, Alab Joranjala for our dear friend, teacher, professor.
थैंक यू दिल को छू लेने वाला संगीत श्रीनिवास जी थैंक यू सो मच एंड आई एम श्योर पद्मनाभ जी uh, भी जानते होंगे कि जस्ट लाइक बुक्स पुस्तकों की तरह ही म्यूजिक भी हमारे जीवन में सकारात्मकता या नकारात्मकता रखने के लिए उतना ही महत्वपूर्ण होता है एंड दैट्स वाई ही हैज सो मच लगाव विथ म्यूजिक थैंक यू सो मच आई वुड लाइक टू आस्क यू इफ यू हैव दैट वीडियो रेडी इफ यू वुड लाइक टू प्ले द वीडियो of uh, shri jaini ji our tech team will help you uh, can i do that that would be yes um as we have up. some time here we can go ahead and okay can i share the screen yes the tech team uh, nayan ji can you please help shrinivas ji i think i can do it okay perfect yeah. so maybe i should just introduce it real fast Um I spend a lot of time with Professor Really actually <clears throat> I mean over the last you know number of years uh but uh that that wasn't working This last year um I recorded a number of hours with him um which are going to be published soon and I'm very excited to share that with everybody uh, I interviewed him for I think over 15 hours um so there's about 10 hours of good footage that will be released by sahapedia is who funded that um but here's a clip that i liked because it's not part of those and also it just shows like this is a day i just showed up at professor's house and this is what he's doing i mean the love for music and you'll see him at, at the age of 97 so it'll be nice for everyone so um can you see this can you see my screen Okay so I'll make it full screen yes. I if I can Yes we can see your screen All right Our body is pandavi on the cover Is there a verse about vitala Hmm Bhima is the river flows near Pandharpur. Yeah. That bhav bhakti itself is Bhima Nadi. Sharira itself is Pandharpur. And Vithal is Atman. Kaya itself is Pandharpur. Yeah. Atma is Vithal. Also a very stubborn man as you all well know. You want to raise the sound professor? Daya samaksha. Daya samaksha. Shanti itself is the desert there. Have you been to Pandharpur? Not yet. Oh, you should. I have been there several times. previous one the verse line i i was a miss that no when is you are going to pandarpur body itself is pandarpur and vithal is your atma this 
Yeah. Ten yeah, Indriyas are Karma Indriyas. Karma Indriyas together, big sense. Thus, yeah. They themselves are ten people, bhaktas together. Aha. Uh -huh. So this is ten people come and bhajan. Both of us this happens. I am Atma Brahma. Yeah. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah. That's what it is. A hundred percent it is. But here, I am Atma. So I'll stop it there. Just to give you a sense of, see, he'll be listening to that all day long. And then all he hears there is he sees, he says Upanishads and I am Atma Brahma. I mean, like, professor's understanding of you know, all of these traditions, what we call Jainism or Buddhism or Hinduism, it all was one expansive, you know, uh, you know, panorama of, of thought that intersected and influenced each other. And I think in all the years I said to him, that's the thing I think I took away probably the most is, 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 is the interconnectedness of it all. So anyway, that's a little highlight and I hope to have those available. And thank you also for listening and Thank you so much to Tara Setiaji and all the panelists for sharing their wonderful experiences with us today. Thank you. And as, as Taraji said, the link uh, for the special uh, publication from Ahimsa um, is in the chat. Uh, newsletter, Ahimsa newsletter is in the chat box. So if anyone would like to go ahead and uh, read that, please go ahead. Also, I can see many messages here from around the world, from Karanja, Maharashtra, India, and um, other uh, followers of uh, Sri Jainiji saying, uh, giving tribute to him. So thank you so much for everyone who joined us today um, to celebrate uh, Sri Padmanabhji Jaini. Thank you so much. So, um, In life, things happen around us, things happen to us, but the only thing that truly matters is how you choose to react to it and what you make out of it. Life is all about learning, adopting, and converting all the struggles that we experience into something positive. Professor Sri Padmanabhji Jaini's life teaches us so many valuable lessons. Our generation is lucky to have met him and have close contact with Sri Jainiji, this legend. And with that, I would like to request Sri Girish Ji Shah. Girish Ji Shah, uh, Jaina Ratna Awardee in 2011, co-founder of Jaina, past president and board chair of JCNC, co-founder and benefactor member of JCNC, Silicon Valley Inter-Religious Council Board Chair. Please welcome Sri Girishji Shah. Jai Jinendra, namaste and pranam to all of you. On behalf of JCNC Board, Executive Committee and members, I want to welcome you all and thank you for joining the celebration of the life of Professor Jaini, as I always called him, Professor Jaini. Before I go on, I would like to just tell you that as I heard the news of his passing, it is our usual practice at the Jain Temple, Jain Center, to have a memorial service. So I reached out to who else? Prem Jain, you know, my brother in crime, and uh, so I say, hey, we got to have a memorial service. And as you heard from him, he said, no, Professor Jainis does not want any memorial service. So I said, well, then what can we do? He says, he says, celebrate his work. So we then decided that we should celebrate his work by inviting all of you 
to this con wonderful conference. And we started working on it. And our president, Jain Center President Biren Shah, took the charge of it and really organized this conference very well. We can all learn about Professor Jaini's life and his contribution to Jaini Ji. We, we, we felt that even though he was our own from the Jain Center in Northern California, he was much bigger than our own. So it was a worldwide figure, a towering scholar and a, and a gentleman. So we should invite the Jaina to this conference and go sponsor it and jointly organize this. So we talked to Mehta Bhai Vadar and immediately he said yes. And th thereby this conference is now a worldwide conference organized through Jaina and Jain Center of Northern California. So it just gives you how things mature or how things happen when things have to happen. Words will never be enough to describe his life. He was a giant among the giants. But I have learned a lot personally through this conference and all the scholars who have talked to, he talked about his life, that many of the things that I did not know, even though I thought I knew him well. But let me tell you some of my experiences. I won't talk about his academic uh, uh, career or academic contributions because all of the other one, scholars here are more familiar and they will tell us about it. You know, one thing that I always found, in his presence, you always felt that you are his best friend. My wife and I, he made us feel as if nothing else mattered except us. He always praised her, praised me, and always complimented on various things. And of course, as usual, his advice as to what we should do or we should not do. At one point, he gave my wife a stack of paper because she does a lot of aradhana. And so says, here, read this aradhana things that will help you in your aradhana. That's how he was always trying to help you and give you new, new information, new direction for your achievements. But as, a, as, a, as you heard, He's always ready to give advice. He's always ready to uh, you know, contribute his uh, scholarly knowledge to everyone who is listening to him. But I never felt, you never felt that if he is talking, he is talking with a great, there's a feeling that you know, I am a great scholar. He's always talking with humility, with respect, and always never made you feel as if you don't know enough and he is giving you advice. His advice was such beautifully done that you felt like a friend and always take him as a friend. We at Jain Center were very fortunate to have him as our own. In early days of Jain Center after forming into Jain Center of Northern California, which is in 1981, which is when I started to know him as I returned from Indonesia in 1979 after nine year uh, trip to Indonesia uh, for my work. And in early periods, as we will organize a program, he will always be there. And a lot of times, so one of the scholars that we invited for that event may not show up or has not been able to deliver. And we will ask him impromptu to give us, you know, his wisdom. And he will be always ready and he would have such profound words of wisdom that you will say, why are we inviting others? We have him here. We should invite him in every event. And, you know, Prem was the first president after JCNC it was formed in 81, I was the second. And we always felt, you know, why, why are we looking for scholars elsewhere? We just ask him. Of course, he says, no, you invite others, not just me alone. I'm always there. So that was always wonderful to see him constantly, you know, contributing to our knowledge. And like Prem has said, he has always told us how to organize, how to keep unity, how to, uh, you know, in 19, 8, 9, 1991, the uh, fifth, uh, sixth China Convention in Stanford, 
he was there for three days and uh, really made us, our academic conference, the side of it, a wonderful experience. And that became a standard part of Jaina Convention, which has been carried out even today. So you see at Jaina Convention, multi-track, multi-scholar, uh, and the last Jaina Convention, I think, had uh, 250 plus uh, virtual seminars, which are still available. So it is something that he contributed towards organizing that. Lastly, I want to say, we are proud to have him known as such a great soul, to call him our friend. We will remember him fondly and celebrate his life contribution to Jain studies throughout the world. He was, I mean, he, his, his, learning his life, you learn that he worked with scholars and scholars, scholars of scholars in Jainism, you know, from uh, Premiji to uh, Suklalji, he really learned, but he took advantage of all of those learning opportunities to become his own self as a giant. We will remember him fondly and contribute his contribution. Sorry, I said that already. We at JCNC acknowledge his contribution to our son, our society, our center, because he was the founding member of Jain Milan, which is what we started with. I want to thank all of the scholars who, grad, who easily accepted our invitation to join this conference to really celebrate his work and his contribution to our world. And that makes a, our world a better place for everyone else. I also want to thank all the organizers, particularly Biren Shah, and Mahesh Bhai Wadar and Sarita Ji for making this into wonderful conference and wonderful experience. You know, I was going to start by saying, how can one follow the beautiful rendering of the sitar by, you know, Sri Redi Ji and, you know, his, all these experiences from organized by Tara Setia Ji. But obviously, you know, somehow you have to always follow the great performances so I want to thank them for such a great performance. Thank you, Jai Jinendra. Thank you so much, Girishji, for your kind words. Thank you. In his knowledge and style of scholarship, Jainiji was exceptional, even his, his own generation, without access to YouTube or Google. And driven by his own inner enthusiasm, Jainiji acquired learning in a manner and with a comprehensiveness inconceivable for someone born in the 21st century. Main itre se mehku, ye meri arzu nahi. Main itre se mehku, ye meri arzu nahi. Tamanna hai, mere kirdar se khushbu aaye. Tamanna hai, ki mere kirdar se khushbu aaye. With that, I would like to invite our next panel, led by Professor John Cott. And the topic for the panel is Reflections on the Scholarly Career of Professor Padmanabhji Jaini. Professor John Cott, Professor Emeritus of Asian and Compar Comparative Religions at Denison University at Granville, Ohio, where he also taught in the East Asian Studies, Environmental Studies, and International Studies programs. He's the author of Jains in the World, Religious Values and Ideology in India and Framing the Jinnah, Narratives of Icons and Idols in the Jain History, as well as several dozen articles on the Jains and on the culture, history, and literature of Western India. Please welcome Mr. John Court with his panel. Thank you, uh, Savita, for that very generous introduction. And thank you again to all of the organizers um, all over the place who are doing a wonderful job. Those of you who are just watching are not aware of all of the chats and uh, things that are flying back and forth to keep this uh, well organized. So a hand to the organizing team uh, for all of their work. I should also 
say that um, there will be a little bit of a change in the schedule in the next two panels on um, scholarly appreciations of Professor Janey. Um, and so the first session uh, will have four speakers. Uh, we'll start with Professor Alexander von Rospot from University of California. University of California, Berkeley, although he's actually in Italy, which is why he's going first. Um, and then we will continue the European theme with Melanie Balbier, Professor Peter Flugel, and Professor Ole Karnstrom. So uh, Professor von Rospat, Professor of Buddhist and South Asian Studies and Director of the Group in Buddhist Studies at University of California, Berkeley, um, a position that was uh, I think it was actually the direct one that, that, that Professor Janey occupied, if I'm not mistaken, but um, he's a successor of that. Professor Ros von Rospat specializes in the doctrinal history of Indian Buddhism and in Mewar Buddhism, the only Indic Mahayana tradition that continues to survive in its original South Asia setting in the Kathmandu Valley. Um, he has authored numerous books and articles and researched various aspects of the Mewar tradition including narrative literature, art historical heritage, and tantra rituals and their origins and evolution. Before he joined Berkeley in 2003, he served as assistant professor at the University of Leipzig and taught on visiting appointments at universities of Oxford and Vienna. More recently, he has also taught as a visiting professor at the University of Munich and at the International College for Postgraduate Buddhist Studies at Tokyo. So Alex, you're on. Thank you very much, John, for and thank you for my fellow, uh, fellow panelists for your flexibility and allowing me to go first. That does help me. Um, it's exactly 20 years ago that I came to Berkeley first as a visiting professor. And I was very excited when I received the invitation to teach in the graduate program of the group uh, of the Buddhist studies. Of course, knowing um, the work of Professor Jaini, which had been very important for my own uh, research on Abhidharma and the Buddhist tradition. And um, I'm deeply grateful to Professor Jaini, who opened his doors and opened his arms, welcomed me and my family um, then with my wife and uh, uh, daughters and uh, Professor Jaini's uh, wife, Sashi, and his son, Arvin, were very, very generous. And um, he's remained over the uh, next 20 years um, a much appreciated and admired colleague whom I always called, called Acharya but also very, very dear friend. And um, I must say, uh, I uh, dread the moment when I return to Berkeley later, later this year, and um, I will not be able to call upon uh, Professor Jaini as I always did when I returned from travels. And when I was uh, bidding farewell in May leaving, of course, I did it with a feeling, you know, keep it, I, I do hope um, that we will uh, see each other again. And um, unfortunately, that was not do be to be. But I'm very grateful um, uh, to, uh, to you, Acharya, should you be tuned in from uh, some other realm and listening to these words. I'm very grateful to your generosity with which you took me under your win wings and um, celebrating um, your birthday in, in uh, your beautiful garden surrounded by the roses planted by Sashi um, uh, exactly a year ago is um, remembered very much. Um, and um, so, um, of course, I also owe to Professor Jaini the invitation to come to Berkeley 20 years ago. And he had founded, um, he founded um, as of today, as he founded nearly 50 years 
ago a PhD program in Buddhist studies that um, we in Berkeley believe to be um, cutting edge and it's still a thriving program. And um, in April, um, in coming April, we will celebrate um, the 50th anniversary of our program. And um, uh, we will talk in great detail on the occasion about um, the momentous contribu contributions uh, Professor Jaini made also in the field of Buddhist studies. But um, uh, allow me to um, cite uh, Professor Jaini. Um, when, you know, as he was nearing his end, he, he was quite stern on one um, occasion with me and, and told me, I don't like hagiography hey, hey, making and uh, don't, overdo, we would do, don't overdo it with memorial events, please. My legacy are my writings and my students. And indeed, he produced um, a whole generation of professors of Buddhist studies, Janet Gyatso of Harvard University, Robert Buswell of UCLA, Mark Blum of our very own uh, Berkeley program, Carl Bielefeld of Stanford, and the list goes on, David, Professor Davidson from Fair Fafield, Professor Kritzer, Notre Dame in, Jap in uh, Japan, and also uh, a, a fair number of um, Asian colleagues. And of course, Christy Wiley, who spoke so beautifully um, before. Um, but um, all these uh, names are colleagues who became professors and took the um, field forwards in new directions. But what really is remarkable, Professor Jaini um, retired in 94, so 27 years ago, but that did not mean he stopped um, contributing. Um, he pulled off something that is very, very difficult at Berkeley to keep an emeritus professor office. Uh, uh, hardly um, uh, anybody is granted this privilege. It normally takes a Nobel Award in order in, in Berkeley to be allowed to keep your um, emeritus um, uh, uh, office. And uh, he used it very, very well, rain and, or shine, walking down from the Berkeley Hill down to campus and walking back that kept him, of course, in excellent shape. And um, when he was in his office, he was always accessible to his colleagues, also to me, but to generations of our graduate students in the group in Buddhist studies, also in the Department of South and, say, South and Southeast Asian Studies, so he's been a very important teacher of mentor, uh, a mentor for generations of Berkeley students, not only of Buddhism, also of Jainism, and um, also of the Brahmanical tradition. And um, I remember in 2013, he graciously joined my Jainism class to follow uh, Prem Jain's invitation to visit the Milpitas uh, Temple uh, Center of Jainism for the uh, Mahavir Jayanti celebration. Thank you so much, Prem. I remember that day vividly, and I remember how much uh, joy Professor Jaini and also Sashi derived from this, and how much it meant um, to um, our students. Um, and this is one thing maybe I would like to say in connection. Yes, this was in the context of a Jainism class and we went to a Jain temple, but um, uh, he was, uh, Professor Jaini never took um, uh, a boundaries between different denominations series, be it between Shvetambaris or Digambaras, 
or be it uh, between Jainism, Buddhism, or dif different Brahmanic traditions. And he also had a very deep other understanding um, of Judaism and Christianity, and also to some extent of Islam. And um, uh, he had a um, great ability to think across different religious traditions, because I think ultimately he was convinced of the you uh, of the fact that human beings are, you know, one and motivated and driven by the very same concerns, and that the different religious tr traditions speak to this in different manners. But he certainly saw certain um, uh, unity in that um, uh, uh, respect. And that what makes his scholarship so outstanding. He was able to engage Buddhism and Jainism as traditions that were deeply in converse, conversation with, uh, with each other. His um, uh, uh, essay on the Shramanere movement, uh, on the ascetic movement, remains the gold standard in the field as far as I'm concerned. Um, and um, talking about um, his continued activities, when he joined Berkeley, he came from Michigan. And he was a very distinguished scholar. He came from the School of Oriental and African Studies in London. He had also been teaching at Banaras Hindu University. And he had done a tremendous um, uh, 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 job of editing a very difficult Abhidharma manuscript of a text called Abhidharma Deeper. And what really stands out is that he didn't have the help of Tibetan or Chinese translations. So the um, uh, edition had to be done only on the basis of rather blurred images that Raoul Sanskrit Yainai once took. And this continued to be a great uh, concern of, Jain, of Professor Jaini and actually has a Japanese uh, collaborator, Professor Kenyo Mitomo from Risho University. And they managed to get hold of scans of that manuscript that Professor Jaini was never able to see and use for his important publication. So um, actually the world awaits the missing parts of the Abhidharma deeper that has been co-edited by Professor Jaini and uh, Professor Kenyo Mitomo. Um, and uh, I do hope um, this will, um, at some day, um, we will be able to negotiate the political problems of publishing uh, Sanskrit manuscripts that are technically um, stored um, in uh, China. Um, and um, talking about the legacy of Professor um, Jaini and his students, his ongoing works and his publications, and I would also like to kind of make a pitch for Berkeley we are just um, filling a position, a professorial position for Sanskrit and a lectureship for Sanskrit. And Berkeley is deeply committed to the study of Indian religion. Particular dream of us is to focus more on Jainism We've been um, uh, uh, in conversations with the Jain community, but uh, let me um, uh, reassure all people in the community that UC Berkeley is committed to um, continue and deepen and broaden the study of Indian religions. We have uh, one of the finest programs in the Buddhist studies, which we are very proud of. 
but we want to become a um, powerhouse for giant studies. And we are convinced that we are particularly well positioned to do this because we have all the language teaching in place, not only Sanskrit, Pali and Prakrit. And um, when I'm thinking of the legacy of um, Professor uh, Jaini and in many ways, what can be done to honor uh, that le legacy, uh, allow me to use my brief address for a plea for supporting uh, giant studies at UC Berkeley. Thank you very much for uh, your patience and uh, your um, uh, attention. Thank you uh, to all of the organizers. And thank you also, Srini, for the wonderful music you offered before. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Alex, uh, for that really sort of good reminder yet again of the role of Professor Jaini in uh, UC Berkeley and in Buddhist studies, not only in the US, but globally. That was, a, you know, we, we tend to sometimes forget that. Um, next, I want to turn to Professor Melanie Balvir, who teaches Indology at Sorbonne University and also yeah, teaches Middle I, Indian philosophy. If I, Excuse sorry, me? John, if, John if, if I may just add this to, to what you said, I mean, of course, uh, many of us panelists were uh, present when um, we celebrated uh, Professor Jaini's 90th birthday in 2013 with a, a big conference dedicated to the study of Jainism, again, uh, uh, with the help and support of Prem G, who is here as, um, uh, as part of the panel. So um, uh, thank you for um, uh, John uh, for pointing out that indeed uh, Berkeley in many ways um, you know is a torch holder and continues to be torch holder in this field. Thank you. I'm sorry, Nalini, for um, oh, okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. So um, to Nalini, as I was saying. She also teaches Middle Indian philology at the Ecole Pratique des Hautes Etudes uh, en Paris. Um, her main research is in uh, the Jain tradition and all its diversity, uh, doing historical work on literature, on canonical texts, uh, but has also done a lot of important work on contemporary Jain practice and material culture. Uh, during the last several years, she's been focusing on um, editing of Jain manuscript collections, um, investigating colophons and paintings on them, and the way in which text and visual culture interact. Um, details of her publications will be found on the website of the Research Group on Indian Studies at uh, Paris. So, Nolly, please. Thank you. Uh, so, first, I would like to say that I'm very honored to participate in this event, and I feel thankful to all the organizers for such a beautiful event, and especially to John, who is coordinating this panel. When I was asked uh, to send pictures or videos where I would have featured uh, with Professor Jaini, I did not react because unfortunately, I do not have any such document. In fact, I am not really among those who have interacted with Professor Jaini very frequently in person. The occasions where I could discuss face-to-face -face separately with him have been rather rare, which of course is a matter of regret for me. Nevertheless, I have met him a few times in academic contexts, and you will not be surprised if I say that each time it happened, I was struck by the charismatic figure he was, resplendent with serenity, humor, a graceful, an all-conquering smile, and so much gentleness. Respect, admiration, and sympathy were the feelings aroused in me by his presence. These meetings took place in London around 2000, when my Indian Ahmedabad colleagues and myself were working on the British Library manuscript catalog 
sponsored by the Institute of Drainology. Professor Jaini did support effectively the activities of this structure directed by a group of London Jains who were very active for putting Jainism in the foreground on the world religious map. Professor Jaini participated in a delegation to the Vatican in 1995, presenting his Jainapos of purification. He also wrote the introduction on the Jaina faith and its history for the Tatvarta Sutra translation under the title That Which Is, uh, which was selected to represent the Jain tradition in the sacred literature series. These are some proofs, among many others, of Professor Jaini's concern for outreach activities aiming at an increased visibility of Jain presence in public space. As a Jain and as a scholar, he considered it was his duty not to remain in his ivory tower. And we have heard uh, earlier how we participated in many activities with the Jain community in America, especially. For me, one of the most memorable events when I interacted with Professor Jaini is the conference which had been organized in his honor by Professor Ole Kornström, a part of this panel. This was in Lund in 1998. The papers were later, edit, later edited in a very rich felicitation volume where Professor Jaini himself delivered a path-breaking essay on the story of Rishabha's mother, Maru Devi, as representing a unique example of a single soul making a linear progression from Nigoda to Moksha. During one of the Lund dinners, I remember, Professor Jaini narrated to guests present at his table stories relating to his childhood and youth. This was long before his memoirs, Yoga Yoga, was published. In his oral telling and later in the book, I was fascinated and moved by the itinerary of this young boy, always in quest for more knowledge on the Indian traditions in their entirety. His life was a kind of unexpected Digvijaya, a conquest of directions like what Indian universal emperors, Chakravartins, set for in the past. It led him from a small village in Tulunadu to Maharashtra, Gujarat, Ceylon, Burma, UK, and USA. I was deeply touched by the affection and gratitude he always showed to his mentors and well-wishers, clearly saying in action that we need others to give our best. Coincidences certainly played an immense role in Professor Jaini's scholarly journey, but only his hard work, brilliant intelligence, and dedication have fruitfully developed the encounters he had made all along. Having the good fortune of meeting great scholars is one thing, having the ability to take these meetings as opportunities for further progress and continuous opening to new horizons is another one. The young boy who had been brought up in an educated and dedicated Digambara Jain family from Tulu remained attached to his unique background culture. But he was later exposed to Shwetambara Jainism, discovering the Murti Pujak and Stanagvatins. He describes, for instance, how he was surprised by the Chintamani Parshwanath image, crowned and with artificial eyes that stare at you, so very unlike the Digambara images, nude and free from any ornaments he had, be, he had been used to see so far. He read all the Jain scriptures in depth, whether Digambara or Shwetambara, and had an unrivaled command of all the main languages involved, whether classical or modern, northern or southern. And then a young Jain traveling to Ceylon in order to study the Pali scriptures with Buddhist monks. This was rather uh, astonishing. The pioneering life of a scholar had started with this particular trip, a scholar who would keep exploring unknown areas and produce groundbreaking editions, translations, monographs, articles on topics that had so far remained out of the main path. 
these achievements are what has really inspired me in my own work. In particular, I am sensitive to the broad-minded approach of Jainism writings. Jainism is thought of therein as one stream of shamanic culture and history, along with Buddhism in particular, and relationships of both with the Brahmanical environment are always the wide frame against which every aspect has been studied. Jainism oeuvre forms a multicolored scholarly production of which each work is a jewel. Among one of my favorites stands the remarkable article on the Vasudhara Dharani, a Buddhist work in use among the Jainas of Gujarat, published in 1968, which Jaini says in his memoirs marked the beginning of his comparative study of Buddhism and Jainism. What he did in this article was typical of his method. He brought to light an out outstanding literary and religious text, which was totally unknown. Few manuscripts only were traced at that time. In addition, this text belongs to works of ritual and magic, to make it simple. This was a trend for which there was hardly interest in Jain and Buddhist studies 50 years ago when the article was published. Similarly, the exploration of Bhavasena's Bhukti Vichara and Kevali Bhukti Vichara brought to light two rare works known through a single manuscript in Kannada script, script, which drew attention on issues that are crucial in the Digambara Shwetambara differentiation spiritual liberation for women or not, and food or not for an omniscient being. Works focusing on ideological controversies. Vichara are indeed a trend for which Professor Jaini created a path. Another favorite writing of mine is his study of the 84 points of contention, Chaura Sibol, as expressed by the Jain Hemraj Pandey, a lively evidence of what inter intersectarian discussions in, in, in 17th century North India could be. In a way, the Mukti Vichara article just mentioned formed a pillar for the outstanding building that became the 1991 book, Gender and Salvation, a contribution unique in novelty and thoroughness, which has now become a widely read classic. The same is true, of course, of the often celebrated Jaina Path of Purification, an era opening book for the presence of Jainism in university teaching, the only 20th century academic handbook on Jainism, giving a full place to the specificities of the Gambara culture, which had often been minimized earlier. The same characteristics, new discoveries without limitation, allied with thoroughness of investigation, define Professor Jaini's work in the field of Pali studies, for which he has given unparalleled contributions. His energetical efforts have resulted in increasing considerably our knowledge of the use of Pali in Southeast Asia through extra canonical works. He has made known to us commentaries, ritual texts, stories, wisdom verses, or poetical treatises that were so far ignored, publishing in editions and translations with the Pali Text Society. To conclude, I would say that for me, like for many, Professor Jaini has been a tremendous source of inspiration through his achievements and personality. I consider that he has combined the best of all cultures and educations in an ideal manner into a fully radiating person with great humanity. The broadness with which he conceives the fields of philology and religious studies is a lesson for us to imitate and meditate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nalini, um, for sharing a talk that builds on uh, Alex's in, in a whole lot of ways. And I think uh, some themes that we've seen throughout the afternoon, morning, day, whatever we are, and uh, continue. Um, now let me introduce uh, Peter Flugel, uh, the founding chair and um, uh, 
founding chair of the Center of Jain Studies and professor of study of religions and philosophies at the Department of History, Religions and Philosophies in the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London, where Professor Janey taught many years ago. Um, he has published, Peter's published extensively in history, anthropology, and sociology of contemporary Jain schools and sects on Jain relic stupas, on Jain Vaishnava syncretism, and on the social, socio-political and legal history of the Jain tradition. He convenes the annual Jain Studies workshops at SOAS and is editor of the International Journal of Jain Studies, amongst other series. So, Peter, you're on. Thank you very much for inviting me to uh, this uh, panel. And uh, first of all, I would like to um, assent to what Girish said. I felt exactly the same way. Uh, in the presence of Padmanabh Jaini, one always had the feeling one is his best friend. And uh, this is a, a unique ability he was uh, uh, carrying. And uh, we all feel uh, very uh, touched by uh, having been met, having met him. Now, uh, what is Professor Jaini's contribution to the understanding of Jain religion? Um, he was, uh, of course, uh, closely associated uh, with uh, SOAS. Uh, and uh, uh, in 1956, he was invited by John Bruff to join the SOAS Department of Indian Languages and Literature, where he served for 11 years as lecturer in Pali, PhD candidate and reader in Pali and Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit. In 1967, Jaini accepted an invitation to join the University of Michigan as a full professor in Sanskrit to teach courses in Buddhism. In 1972, he accepted yet another invitation and joined the new Buddhist studies program at Berkeley, where he stayed until his retirement. And my understanding is that Fritz Stahl was uh, instrumental in all this, but I don't uh, know all the details, which would be interesting to hear. Uh, Professor Jaini was born into a Digambra Jain family in coastal Karnataka and published many original works in Buddhist and Jaina studies. In addition to a great number of celebrated text editions, such as the already mentioned Abhidharma Deepa with Vibhasha Prabha Vritti of 1959, or the Lagutattva Spota of Amrita Chandra Suri of 1978, and numerous research papers, two of his books uh, amongst, uh, and numerous research papers, two of his books became standard textbooks, The Jaina Path of Purification in 1979, and Gender and Salvation of 1991. Um, since we are sharing stories, I could mention that I acquired the Jaina Path of Purification um, at the Dylan's Bok Bookshop here in London, which is very famous um, in the university bookshop. And they, they sold it uh, for one pound because they couldn't uh, sell it at the time to anyone. And so I got it very cheaply, and I, I was, was so happy to see that book. Uh, at, at, as a student, one does not have many funds. Um, Professor Janey was associate member of the SOA Center of Jaina Studies and remained one of its principal supporters. His last major work, Coincidences, Yoga Yoga, uh, his memoirs of 2019, uh, are more than an autobiography. The text relates in great detail almost all dates and facts that need to be remembered about this great scholar and human being and uh, of the social context and chance encounters that shaped his life and work. So in a way, he, he took away all the, the duty of his uh, friends and uh, disciples to summarize his, his life and, and, and write about it because um, he himself did so. And I was very uh, interested, like we all were in this, this book. And uh, um, it, it conveys unique insight into a scholar's life. Uh, 
it is very difficult to find details on Indologists' uh, um, uh, careers. Uh, for some reason, they're very cagey. They never share any, any anecdotes in their uh, published work. So one has to figure out, or later historians have to figure out what actually motivated one or other person uh, to go into all this work and uh, this suffering in, in archives and libraries. So we, we learn quite a lot about him in this book. And uh, since I knew that uh, the uh, previous speakers would summarize the uh, um, scholarly achievements, considerable scholarly achievements of Padmanap, I uh, thought I reiterate um, what he wrote in his latest um, piece, i.e. a small article on uh, reflections on karma, uh, which he published in the newsletter of the Center of Jain Studies. And I share, now that works, my screen. Oops. I'm not sure I have the the share uh, permission because it is stuck. Yeah, yeah, Peter, Peter, you, you can't share. Sorry, you can't share screen. So if you can just summarize it. Um, well, I was told I, I could, but I can summarize it anyway. I wanted to show some photographs of significance in my view, but I can share uh, what he said in this uh, text and. Uh, um, I think the problem is here with my computer, which, uh, oh dear. <laughs> I don't know whether anyone can hear me. We, we can hear you, Peter. Uh, but uh, the thing went, went completely black. Um, well, I can uh, just talk from memory. Uh, basically, it shows what a critical thinker he was. Uh, Padmanab was uh, uh, an extraordinary uh, committed Jain, but to understand Jaina religion, he knew you have to first of all understand all the other religions, the wider context, history, and you, you cannot uncritically uh, just uh, repeat what is presented in front of you. You have to reflect on the matter. So, and reflections on karma, and now I can see it again. He, uh, he writes, I came to the conclusion, talking about his personal life, that karma had nothing to do with what was happening in my life. And I thought that is an extraordinary statement for a person so dedicated to his own religion. And it shows what great scholar he was and uh, what consummate scholar he was. That was in a way his prime commitments towards uh, objectivity, towards uh, insight, gaining more knowledge, etc. And uh, like uh, previous speakers, I'm, I remember very well this meeting in San Francisco in the uh, Danam conference, or after the Danam conference, where he was due to give an after dinner speech uh, very briefly. And uh, two hours later, he was the last person in the room standing. <laughs> he simply could not stop. He was uh, the embodiment of a scholar. So he came to the conclusion that karma is not, had nothing to do with his, uh, uh, the events in his life, he, which he related in his memoir. Although karmas might have determined the general para parameters of my life, they're not a factor from the perspective of the specific trajectory that my career has taken. Now coming from BHU to SOAS, Michigan and uh, California. I therefore believe that whatever happens in one's life does not happen either by karma or a superhuman agency like gods or deities. I do not deny that my associations with various individuals mentioned in my memoirs have impacted the direction that my life took and thus resulted in modifications of my soul. But I've come to the conclusion 
that these specific relationships are most likely not the result of karma in my past lives, nor in the lives of these individuals. Instead, these interactions are related to the mutuality of interests of two individuals, which then impact each other. And this is really what sansara is all about. This concept is expressed in Tatvarta Sutra 5 to 1, uh, Parasparopagraho Jivanam, which I understand as souls having an impact on one another due to mutual interests. I believe that our lives are the result of the impact of similar interests. And then he uh, explains that he met Pandit Suklalji, Professor Braff, etc., mainly because they had shared interests and uh, there's no hidden mystery of anyone producing causal connections of happiness or unhappiness. This being the case, he concludes, the only way to break this mutuality guided by kashaya is through restraint from activity, yoga, and passions, kashaya, which is called samvara. And ultimately, this restraint leads to moksha, the final separation of karmic matter from the soul, never to be bound again. And uh, let me try once more whether this works. No, it doesn't. I wanted to show you a picture which uh, Padmanabh had in his office. And uh, he had a number of pictures, as you as frequent visitors all know. Uh, his uh, encounter with the Pope and from Sri Lanka, uh, a picture and so on. But he. Uh, took a photocopy co of a, a, a photograph of Mangi Tungi, um, where you see Balarama depicted from the back, a sculpture. And uh, I mean, I incidentally, I took that picture, but uh, uh, it is uh, surely well known in the Jain community. And I don't know a second picture like it, but I thought, you know, what does it mean to him? Um, we had no time to discuss it because he was uh, always uh, engaged in, in so many, sharing so many ideas. Um, but I think his words about karma and leaving uh, the world of social interaction and shared interests behind, that must have, there must be a resonance somehow. In any case, thank you for uh, listening to my musings and I say Jay Jinendra. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, and I sent everyone the link to the, uh, the newsletter article that uh, you were talking about. Um, finally, um, Ole Kvarnström, um, who is the organizer of the famous um, conference in memory in honor of Professor Janey at Lund, a wonderful time, many of us remember fondly. Professor of History of Religions at Lund University in Sweden his research has primarily been devoted to medieval philosophical and theological traditions of Brahmanism, Buddhism, and Jainism, whose ideological systems, conflicts, and mutual influences have been studied from previously unworked source material in Sanskrit, Prakrit, and Tibetan. So the multi-language uh, theme comes up again. Um, he's also studied uh, Indian art and Jain relations with Islam as part of his research. So Oleg. Uh, thank you very much. Um, dear friends and colleagues, um, it's a great honor to have been invited to speak at this global event, celebrating the work of Professor Padmanab S. Jaini. The first time I met Professor Jaini was in 1989. And like all those that have had the good fortune of meeting him in person, I was struck by his strong charisma, joyful personality, and vast learning. Over the following years, I had the privilege of both studying under and developing a close friendship with Professor Jaini, who was always a great source of inspiration. Whenever students have asked for introductory textbooks on the Jaina religion, my straight and simple answer always has been the Jaina path of purification, also known as the red book after the color of its cover. And whenever they inquire about additional literature, my consistent answer always has been the blue book and the black book, referring to Jane's in the World by John Court 
and the Jains by Paul Dandas, two of Professor Jaini's closest colleagues. Professor Jaini's scholarship has had a profound impact on research and teaching at various colleges and universities, not only in Sweden, but in the other Nordic countries as well. Today, however, I will not dwell on his extensive and profound contribution to Jaina studies, but would rather say a few personal words about Professor Jaini as a mentor and human being, how he generously and in his own way conveyed his profound knowledge to students and scholars. Professor Jaini's autobiography is entitled Coincidences, a title that reminds me of how I initially came to contact him. In 1989, I read an article by the well-known Belgian pedologist Jean de Jong, in which he mentioned that a certain Jaina text had yet to be translated into English and studied from a historical perspective. This piqued my interest, and thus I reached out to de Jong, who then referred me to Professor Jaini. At this time, I was unknown to Professor Jaini. Still, I chanced contacting him to ask for a letter of recommendation in order to receive a research grant. Generous as always, Professor Jaini sent me an uplifting letter that secured the grant and enabled me to begin my Jaina studies. Soon afterwards, it came to my attention that Professor Jaini was on sabbatical and among other things was to attend a conference in Belgium in honor of the renowned biologist Etienne Lamotte. I also discovered that as an international authority on the Pali language and literature, Professor Jaini planned on visiting the office of the Critical Pali Dictionary, at that time located in Copenhagen. Excited by this news, I immediately wrote to him, asking if it would be possible to meet him in Copenhagen, and wondering if he would like to give some lectures on Jainism at Lund University. To my delight, he accepted. Thus, in October of 1989, that was the year of the San Francisco earthquake. Yeah? I went to Copenhagen to meet Professor Jaini. We met on the platform of Copenhagen Central train station. And from there, we walked to the office of the Critical Poly Dictionary. Next day, we traveled by boat to Sweden and by train to Lund. Professor Jaini so much enjoyed his time at Lund that he extended his stay from the five planned days of lecturing to an entire month which of course I didn't mind at all. During this extended visit, Professor Jaini stayed in my home. And as, a, as custom dictates, I acted as a shishya, providing my guru with food, drink, and all else that he required. Each morning, I would place a peeled orange and a cup of hot tea outside his door, which he then partook of after finishing his daily one hour reading of the Mahabharata. While we breakfasted, Together in my kitchen, he explained Jaina food habits and noted that he had remained a strict vegetarian, vegetarian throughout his entire life. Then during his customary morning walk, he explained about Digvrata and other Jaina vows. Through all of this, I was struck by the fact that the world's most famous Jaina scholars were taking the time to teach a novice like myself about Jainism. What a generous person Professor Jaina was. I certainly had a Jaina hermit in the house. Apart from his being an excellent scholar, from the very start, my spontaneous impression of Professor Jaini was that he was a fine, humble person who was content with his life. Among the many lovely and amusing words spoken by Professor Jaini during his stay, one in particular attests to the innocence and honesty of his personality. Professor Jaini had asked me to record his lectures and one day he asked me if I had been able to do so. I replied, yes, all of his lectures were now on tape. He then explained that the reason for asking to record his lecture was that he planned, to, planned on listening to them when he retired because he actually liked listening to his own voice. And this in turn, he said, Ulla, was because he liked himself. This was not an expression of self-admiration or arrogance but breathed innocence with a twinkle in his eye and much humor. After two weeks in Lund, Professor Jaini was invited to both Uppsala and Stockholm University, where he gave several well-attended and highly appreciated lectures. 
while in Stockholm, Professor Asko Parpala of Helsinki University invited him to Finland to lecture on his book, Gender and Salvation. Two days later, we sat together on the ferry from Stockholm to Helsinki. After Finland, we traveled by train from Stockholm to Lund. And during that journey, Professor Jainik constantly spoke to me about Jainism in America. He was not one for wasting time or indulging in trivial conversation. Over the coming years, my friendship with Professor Jaini strengthened and he invited me to join him in Berkeley on a number of occasions. Professor Jaini also brought scholars and students together and I'm so grateful to him for introducing me to distinguished scholars who later became my colleagues and sincere friends. In 1988, a decade after our first meeting, Professor Jaini returned to Lund in order to attend an international conference on Jainism and early Buddhism held in his honor. Another conference was held in his honor, this time in Berkeley, in connection with his 90th birthday. And it was a joy to see him so vital, positive, and forward-looking. The last time I met Professor Jaini was in 2017. We met almost every day discussing Jainism in relation to other religious traditions. But we also went on long walks in the hills. And while I struggled climbing the steep slopes of Berkeley, our dear friend, then aged 93, walked and talked without any apparent difficulty. He was still energetic and knowledgeable, and like the very first time we met in Berkeley, he continued to enjoy his vegetarian sandwich, taken with an apple and a fixed number of nuts, always at the same time each day, and followed by a walk among the fragrant campus eucalyptus trees. Joined by scholars from all around the world, we are gathered here today to celebrate as best we can an unforgettable human being whose contributions to Jainan Buddhist scholarship can hardly be overestimated. overstated. His erudition and intellectual clarity in combination with his humor and joy have served as great inspiration to all of us. Thank you very much. Hinduism is so many fractured in different different ways like there are Vishnu as God, Shiva as God, Vishnu God will be Vaishnava, Shiva as God will be Shaiva and so and so forth. But the main important thing to talk about uh, my area was how around uh, 2000, uh, around 2500 years ago, let us say, uh, at least that much, if not earlier, by 300 more years, there was a great development of denying the existence of a creator God altogether, that the world was not created by anybody, no human being was created by any other person, and from beginningless things, these things have existed, existed without any creation at all. And so, like gold in a uh, gold-bearing rock sits there impure, nobody has put it there, Similarly, metaphor only, all souls are bound to body and this body soul unit called, we call Jiva living being, this has existed from beginningless times and it will go on until endless times and but there are ways of escaping it etc. This, this recognition comes around 5th century, 6th century, 7th century BC in the Upanishads also in, and Upanishads are mostly in the area what is called today uh, Bengal, U, Bengal, Bihar, UP area, whereas the Vedas are from Punjab area. So the Upanishads are the last portion, that's why it's called Vedanta, the end of Veda. And Jainism and Buddhism also, both the religions, they rose in the same area, today is what is called Bihar, Beng, Bengal area. And these two were essentially denial of creator God altogether. And therefore, they have developed their own idea as to how human beings come to be what they are, how animals come to be what they are. And their religion, therefore, is not based on a belief in a God creator at all. But people are from beginningless times changing continuously, continuously. But the essential thing, namely the living being exists, living being. Eternal doesn't mean never changing. Eternal means never ceasing to be your own original nature.
matter never becomes non matter and the souls do not become non souls and soul is one who has got uh, feeling willing and intelligence these are the three things therefore anything and then then they, they decided that not only human beings have souls as the western world believes that only human beings have souls animals do not have souls at all whereas the indian religions uh, whether you call it hinduism buddhism jainism they are all the same people they all believe that anyone that anything that eats and anything that mates and in that fears for its life and therefore prepares all sorts of possessions more food more mating more this and that and powerful these are the four things are found in animals as well as human beings and anyone who has got these four birds have it bees have it has a soul therefore the idea that only human beings have soul which was idea propounded by jewish christian and muslim they do not consider animals have souls at all whereas indians consider that anything that breathes anything that has a soul and therefore these souls are all to be respected and they keep on changing these souls keep on changing their bodies <coughs> therefore unlike the western religions where humans cannot be born as animals or animals cannot be born as humans indians believed all indian religions believed that humans can become animals animals can become humans the changes go on but the souls remain souls and they adapt to the body in which they are in the 14th century the spanish queen sent columbus to find where india is because they had heard the name india 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 so many times and when he landed here near uh, cuba here he found people and they he called them indians and that word indian was applied then to all the natives of america and south america and even that word was used by british people in australia uh, so the word indian 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 this is all foreigners use indians never called themselves india but now that the british ruled it mughals called it hindustan now we also call it india but bharat the name is the alternative name which the muslims will never use for them bharat bharat is is is, is not allowed to be a muslim may not use sanskrit names at all that kind of thing so in brief i what i am telling now is this that all indians share some basic beliefs that animals have souls unlike the western three religions judaism christianity islam and therefore that develops the idea then that if if animals also have souls then you must not kill any human being as all the western religions also say you must also not kill animals etc and then there was a how to deal with this problem of food and so those who believed that minimum use of uh, meat can be made and therefore uh, certain animals only or certain birds. so hindus are very they, they will not kill bulls and uh, cows etc and this is what the way vegetarianism slowly started with the idea that animals also should be protected leading into because what i speak will last for some time whatever i do will last for some time but it doesn't disappear it will leave its effect so the rising of the effects is the doctrine of karma it is called that whatever you do by body mind and speech that will materialize some day it will have effect on others and so you build up a certain pool of energetic things which are going to survive multiply sometimes even grow like a wheat grows something like that and so this idea that your deeds are responsible for producing new body for you called karma this karma gives you new body as man or woman or animal or human and so and so forth this idea is totally missing in the western three worlds the western three worlds all three are unanimous in this that there was no past for any human baby all human babies are totally new they are reborn they are put into the god sends the every body baby new there is no past at all because if they had a past then that would have another past as in india past as a past past as a past and goes on beginningless time there was never a time when the soul was not bound by body in the indian system whereas here there was never any past for any baby baby or baby is born 
by wish of the god will of the god is everything god sends babies that's what the people believe we think it's superstition but it is really they believe because god's all babies are there for born equal all men are equal etc and so uh, animals are not have no souls at all so even the babies that are born have no past whatsoever each baby is like a new coin being produced from a uh, machine but they are, are they not they are not like that they can't account for that the only answer quran gives god's will if you are what they are if you are a woman and if you are not a man why because god's will and there is no other answer jewish people also have i have read they man thanks god god thanks for creating my man not woman etc but of the thing that he has to thank the god for here it is not so you become a man or a woman according to your mental and physical activities whatever you wish for whatever you want for most likely women are likely to be born as men men are likely to be born as women and there's the balance is more or less so this idea of karmic your own actions leading to rebirth 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 etc through one same soul going through cycles of rebirth etc this is called samskrit word for it, samsara means continuous movement from one body to another this is the basic doctrine of hinduism buddhism and jainism so the idea of celibacy is so deeply seated in buddhism and jainism as well as hinduism all hindu saints uh, who wear the okra robe colors uh, robes because uh, white color was used by the lay people and therefore they use this okra color buddhist monks etc so the idea of celibacy which is not encouraged in the western religions which is only the catholics few catholics have protestants rejected that also uh, luther himself married a nun we know that so the idea of celibacy and non violence ahimsa not to kill animals etc and use as little as possible violence ahimsa and second thing is this uh, brahmacharya celibacy within the religion within uh, household life of course you must have family etc but then renouncing renouncing the world renouncing the home life that became the ideal and that is what buddha walks away at the age of 30 giving giving up his wife and his daughter his son without telling them even mahavira did not even get married according to one one theory others say he was married but both they left the household in their prime age 33 or something like that and so this idea renunciation which is discouraged among islam totally and 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 christianity also believes in married life etc marriage is a sacrament etc so the all the marriage is sacrament even in indian religions you can at a certain age when you have reti- retirement age comes so to say with the permission of your wife you may leave or you may leave together and go etc so there are i idea of renunciation basic to buddhism and jainism also for brahmanic religion but brahmanic religion is being the 80% of the indian population is brahmanic religion maybe remaining 20% is uh, about jains are no more than 4 million jains in the world four four and a half maybe at the most but there were once upon a time buddhists in india they are all become they all became uh, well vaishnavas or the vishnu's followers no matter how many times we listen to him it's never enough it's always something new to learn please welcome once again uh, professor john court with his panel number 2 uh with the topic reflections on the scholarly career of professor shri pradmanath ji jaini okay uh, yes sir. thank you sabina and um we're a little bit behind schedule but um i thank everyone uh for sticking with us all this time especially our our friends and colleagues in india where it's what 2:30 in the morning or something like that um i, I hope this is worthwhile and we have there's three people in the final panel here will be speaking uh first Christopher Key Chapel and then I will speak a little bit and then Professor Robert Goldman um so let's start with with Christopher Key Chapel Doshi Professor of Indic and Comparative Theology um at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles and founding director of the Master of Arts and Yoga Studies program there 
Um, he's published a number of books on Indian religions, including most recently, Living Landscapes, Meditations on the Elements in Hindu, Buddhist, and Jain Yogas. And also he recently co-edited Jugan Jain, whom we heard for uh, Salekana. So Chris. Thank you, John. As we know, Professor Jaini changed the course of academic history with the publication of the Jain Path of Purification, as well as what Professor Goldman helped with, Gender and Salvation, and his several essays on Indian culture and civilization. For years, for decades, his sage wisdom and wry humor enlivened seminars and conferences, and his range of knowledge spanned linguistics, philosophy, history, poetry, art history, as we heard earlier, music, and so much more. So after completing my PhD dissertation at Fordham University in 1980, I became assistant director of the Institute for Advanced Studies of World Religions at Stony Brook University, where I taught Sanskrit and originated courses on yoga philosophy, Hinduism, and Jainism while doing research for my second book. And thankfully, the Institute uh, supported conferences that allowed me to invite many people, including uh, Professor Jaini, who was part of a conference on nonviolence that also included Rabbi Professor Ruben Feuerstone and Mennonite theologian, John Yoder. And Professor Jaini told that exquisite tale of Nehru Proud, the elephant who had spared the life of a hapless rabbit during a forest fire. I think we've probably all heard Professor Johnny give this talk. And I was deeply moved. However, following his talk, my colleague, Janet Gyatso at Stony Brook, who is now Professor of Buddhism at Harvard, posed this challenge. And as we heard earlier, uh, Professor Johnny served on Janet's dissertation committee. And she rather frowningly said, don't Jain monks and nuns go to an unnecessary extreme in their asceticism. And with great aplomb and with professorial authority, Jain gently replied, before any chided her, he said, before judging the lives of these monks and nuns, please spend time with them, visit with them in India, and then make your decision. And these words sunk deeply into my psyche. And as life unfolded, I was given the opportunity to visit India. And in order to prepare for that visit uh, in 1989, I recontacted Professor Jaini and he said, well, go find Dr. Court because Dr. Court is the one who is very, very much in touch. So during that visit, I sought out many leaders within the Jain community, and particularly at Jain Vishwabharati. I took darshan from Acharya Tulsi, Acharya Mahaprajna, or the future Acharya Mahaprajna, and saw so many incredible Jain scholars, including um, Dr. Kapadia, who had been prolific in his writings in the 1930s, and not Maltatya, with whom I had worked on an Abhidharma project a bit earlier. Now, I wanted to sort of lift up three small anecdotes related to his scholarship. The first is being utterly, utterly impressed at a Vedanta conference at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. And the topic of the conference was the Ganeshwari the Marathi sort of vernacular communication of the Bhagavad Gita, an exquisite text of sort of parallel to Dante's Inferno. And lo and behold, this was a text well-known and beloved. We heard earlier of uh, 
Professor Chani's dedication to daily reading of the Mahabharata. And he held forth in Marathi on Ganeshwara and that remarkable uh, moment in Indian history where this very young person changes the course of literature. Another story I wanted to tell is that I once got a communication, a phone call actually, and he said, I've been asked to ghostwrite for Prince Charles. And this was on the occasion of the release of the uh, That Which Is, which was mentioned in the chat for which he served as a primary advisor. And this was not Maltatya's rendition of Tatvarta Sutra. So I very happily wrote words of felicitation in regard to this book that then I believe were uttered by Prince Charles, but that was just one of those moments of generosity that was actually so delightful. And it's with many of us, he would give us professional advice, academic advice. And I remember him telling me, you have a good situation there at Loyola Marymount University. Why would you want to go elsewhere when other people were knocking on my door? But I wanted to end with a quick story from the inauguration of the Ahimsa Center established by Professor Setia at uh, California Polytechnic University in Pomona. And Tara and I have worked quite closely in putting the event together. And my wife and I had suggested people from the advocacy of nonviolence community here in Los Angeles. And one of them, Ruth Beaglehall, had uh, recently launched Center for Nonviolent Parenting and Education. And with her lifelong commitment to eradicating household violence, she, as we know, I think Sweden is very famous for this, um, no capital punishment, not only in schools, but not in the home. You're not allowed to hit your children. And she gave this impassioned speech that sort of went over with a little bit of discomfort in the room as we saw these Indian families sort of looking at one another. This was maybe perhaps a bit of news to the audience gathered that particular day. And then as my colleague, now colleague, uh, Swasti Bhattacharya, who's currently at Harvard at the Women's Studies Center doing a project on Vinoba Bhave, as uh, she mingled with the audience, she just sort of wryly said, well, I grew up in a Gandhian ashram in Sevagram. And my mom and dad, they sure gave me a slap or two. And the Indian family sort of smiled and, and um, didn't really say much. And then she finally sat down at the table and looked Professor Johnny straight in the eye, shared her story, and he became very alert. And he said, well, if I did, I don't think I'd be telling you right here, right now. And with that, I think we really got that sense of the playfulness, the honesty, and the generosity of Professor Jaini. And he always brought us a little bit further along and he always simultaneously managed to keep us as a community, I think quite humble. So I'm very honored to be invited to be part of this celebration of the life of Professor Jaini and his work continues with the work of really all of us, Jai Janendra. Um, thank you, Chris. And um, I will make a few comments uh, here. I mean, it's rather difficult coming at the end of a long afternoon in Central Ohio of uh, many comments that I think hardly anything I'm going to say that hasn't been said before, but uh, some of the best things sometimes need or are worth saying multiple times. But 
let me also thank again Savita for uh, emceeing this for many, many hours and all the people who are organizing this and the tech crew behind the scenes and everyone else. Uh, I was at a conference three days ago where the internet platform completely collapsed and the whole conference had to stop. So uh, these things can go badly. Uh, well done to the tech crew there. Um, and I have to say that um, it's interesting what different of us call Professor Janey or called him. Uh, to me, he was always Professor Janey, no matter how senior, even after I was a professor emeritus, he was still Professor Janey. Um, it, it was my, the way I knew him. Um, but I want to lift up, uh, we, several people have commented on the 1979 Jane Path of Purification and talking about the importance of that. And the late Ken Folkert um, one time said very aptly that you could div divide Jane studies in the West into the pre Janey and the post Janey period. I mean, that really was a watershed book for so many of us. Uh, but why was it so important, um, I think, is worth thinking about. On the one hand, as Christy Wiley said and some others, it was the first introductory textbook, introductory survey of the Janes to take the Degumber Janes seriously. Uh, before that, almost everything was exclusively Shvetambar, exclusively Gujarati oriented. Um, and so he reoriented our understanding of where the Jains had, had been historically for thousands of years. Um, that was a very important move that has been followed up. But also it was the first book I can recall that really treated not just Jainism as a set of abstract ideas, but the Jains as a living community and Jainism as a lived religion. Um, it really brought it to life. I mean, there have been excellent studies in the past I and mean, we still depend on a lot of those earlier scholars you know, who had done detailed philosophical, uh, philological studies of texts and analyzed uh, various past participles in Prakrit and things like that. We, we depend on that work. But the reputation among scholars and certainly students was that Jainism was a rather dry, boring religion. You know, those of us who are my generation remember hearing that, you know, uh, Louis Renu, you know, Jainism is the dark shadow of Buddhism, which was the interesting religion. Um, and, and that it was completely um, disproved by Jane Path of Purification. So you know, we're still in debt to it that way. Um, I also want to comment briefly on two different aspects of his scholarship. I'll lift up, these have been commented before. Um, the fact is we've heard over and over and over again, um, in terms of sheer volume of publications, he was more of a Buddhist scholar than a Jane scholar. Um, most of his early publications were on Buddhism. He was hired at, at SOAS in Michigan and Berkeley to teach Jainism as a Jain, I'm mean, sorry, to teach Buddhism as a Buddhist author. Um, and Jainism was almost sort of a sideline that was tolerated by these institutions, but that's, that wasn't his main persona. Um, but in fact, as several people have commented, he really was always concerned to look at the Jains, the Buddhists, and here I'll use the word Hindus, although he more or less dealt with Brahmanical traditions, side by side in a comparative aspect. That is something he learned in Ahmedabad from Pandit Sukhlalji. Um, and it was Sukhlal, in fact, Sukhlal's close friend and associate, Betra Das Doshi, who'd been to Sri Lanka before, three, three decades earlier, that kind of helped inspire Padmanab to, um, to say, okay, go learn Pali, go to Sri Lanka. Um, but that, that notion that you can't study Jainism alone, you have to study it um, in the contrast and in, in uh, comparison with Hinduism, Buddhism, a little bit of Islam he did. He also did some work as we've heard on uh, Jainism and Christianity. Um, and I think that's an important element in making subsequent Jain studies an important part of the academy, that it's not isolated in a ghetto, but it is in fact part and parcel of mainstream conversations about Indian religions. The other thing that is so important, and here I'm, I'm sort of following on Alex's comments and also a little bit on Sue Lake's comments, talking about the, the growth of academic, uh, of Jain contributions to and support of academia. And here I'm going to make my plea, um, something that Padrana was always very clear on, Professor Janey was always very clear on, was the importance of learning languages. 
Sanskrit, Prakrit, Pali, of course. Um, Kannada, of course. Old Kannada, yes. Um, Marathi, yes. Hindi, yes. Gujarati, yes. Um, I mean, it's rather daunting to go into the study of Jainism, quite frankly. Um, I don't know all those languages. Um, I don't think he knew Tamil, so it's an important one. Um, I don't know if he knew Urdu, which is also actually very important for historical studies, but um, you know, he knew a lot. And he emphasized to his students, they had to study language. Um, and I think this is so very important to, to re recognize. Um, and here's my plea, continue to support uh, the teaching of all these different Indian languages um, which are oftentimes actually endangered in the American Academy these days. So that, that's my, uh, my plea for that. Um, I want to end just on a personal note, though, because um, as with everyone else, I had a long-standing relationship with him. The first time I met him, I was a master's student. So um, I had that same experience a number of others did, that he interacted. We had a number of uh, conversations at some conferences, and he was very supportive of you know, somebody who was just starting his studies at the master's level. Um, he was deeply supportive of my dissertation work, was on my dissertation committee, wrote letters of recommendation for me. And uh, one of the last messages I got from him actually was uh, Christy Wiley commented that she was his email correspondent uh, for a while was an email from him um, in late 2020, early 2021, that he was reading an article I'd sent him and was really enjoying it. So that support that he gave me uh, throughout my career, I really want to uh, emphasize. And with, um, this is actually, I'm not gonna give it to you in the Brudge Basha, and I'm not gonna sing it because we've already had wonderful singing and I would ruin the evening for everybody if I tried to sing. Um, but this is my translation of a pud by Janet Rye, an 18th century Agra-based uh, Braj Basha poet. And I remember actually when the, I, my first translations of Janet Rye, I sent to Padmanabh and he wrote back, he says, oh, you made me so happy. I remember singing those as a young child at the Patshala and Karanja. We all sang Janet Rye's puts. Um, so that was sort of an imprimatur for it. Um, and this is a particularly well-known hymn by uh, Janet Rye, Guru Samandata Nahikoi. No one gives like the guru. And so I, I want to read a little bit of this uh, as a thank you to Padmanabh. No one gives like the guru. The light of the sun is never destroyed. It's only covered by darkness. He desires nothing for himself, but he reigns on every like a cloud. No one gives like the guru. He shines like a lamp in the temple of the three worlds. It is dark here in the shadows, but his light is pure inside and out. For no one gives like the guru. So that's my thanks to Padmanabh. And um, we'll now turn to the last speaker of the session, uh, Professor Robert Goldman, um, who is Professor Emeritus and uh, Professor in the Graduate School of Sanskrit at the University of California, Berkeley where for many years he was a colleague of Professor Janey, and I'm sure he has stories that uh, he could regale us with. Um, Professor Goldman is editor and co-translator of the seven volume translation of the Ramayana of Valmiki, a text that's already come up, author of many books and articles on India and on Sanskrit, including something that I actually used when I was studying Sanskrit for the first time. Thank you, Bob. Uh, the widely used introductory textbook um, Devavani Pureshika, an introduction to the Sanskrit language. So, Professor Goldman. Thank you, John. <clears throat> Jai Jinendra. Sarvebhya Sadaram Namo Namaha. My thanks uh, for uh, all of the organizers and especially for Savita Ji for having coordinated all of this uh, and all the participants. And, and we learned so much about the remarkable life and career of the late Professor Jaini. Now, as far as nomenclature, because perhaps I am the one who has the longest and closest personal relationship through the force of circumstances, yoga, yoga, you might call it, uh, to have been a colleague, friend, and mentee of uh, Professor Jaini for uh, more than 50 years, since we both came to Berkeley in 1971. He is a, vi a visiting professor at that time, and myself as a 20-something sort of smart-alecky kid as an assistant professor. 
Um, over the course of that period, uh, we had such a close relationship so that we only referred to each other, he to me as Bob, and I to him as Janie. No G, no professor, just Janie. We all had that kind of thing. And I want to talk a little bit about that personal side of, of Professor Jaini, and then talk a little bit about the personal interactions I had with him in the scholarly realm, because I think uh, so many people have spoken so uh, learnedly about his uh, contribution to uh, Jain studies and other uh, Buddhist studies and other aspects of Indian civilization. That uh, the, for me to go on about that would be what the, the pundits call uh, Punarukti, you're saying the same thing over and over again, or Pishtapeshana, you're grinding up flour a second time, and so on. Um, he, he was very notable for his equanimity, his calmness with everyone, his ultimate generosity. He was as easy with luminaries such as uh, His Holiness the Papa in Rome, the Pope, or His Holiness the Dalai Lama, as he was with my own uh, four and five-year-old children. He was so sweet with them and so kind and so loving. They loved him and they, with their child's uh, attitude, they uh, had mistaken the word giant for giant. So they always referred to him as Jaini the giant. And in fact, they were ahead of the curve because he was a giant intellectually, pedagogically, uh, and trained as we learned so many, many uh, people over the years. Uh, but he had his own uh, personal life, uh, which had like everyone else's, its ups and its downs. And I wanna give a little shout out to the late Srimati Shesi Jaini, who's been mentioned in uh, passing a couple of times. She was a, a, a sweet and gracious uh, woman, but she was an ideal kind of backstop to Jaini, providing the domestic basis on which he built a career of scholarship, because Jaini was able to spend virtually 24 hours a day reading, studying, and teaching, while Sheshiji managed the household, managed the children. Uh, and uh, th this was a wonderful relationship they had. We had many happy uh, occasions up at the Jaini's uh, residence here up on Parkside Drive in the Berkeley Hills, and they uh, with us. He had, a, as has been addressed, a, a wonderful sense of humor. He loved puns, he loved jokes, uh, and, and yet he was a person of very stable mentality. Um, he would, several people have mentioned the sandwiches, right? Every day he would bring the same sandwich that Sheshiji would prepare for him. It always consisted of the same thing. He always ate it at the same time. And my wife and I, who also worked just next door to him, uh, we always used to go out and have our frozen yogurt for lunch. That was our standard lunch. And he would make fun of us for the yogurt situation. And then I would always say to him, Janie, what are you having for lunch today? And he would always say, same old thing, same old thing. Because he always had exactly the same old thing. And what I meant about that kind of fortitude was some people have also uh, alluded to uh, that very tragic occurrence in, in uh, Janie's life which was the uh, unexpected and horrifying, uh, untimely death of his beloved daughter, Asha. Nobody knows what exactly was the cause of death. I, I myself looked at the uh, medical examiner's report. There was no decision what happened. It was a terrible blow, as you would imagine, to Janie and to uh, his wife and uh, their son. But he had a certain kind of inner fortitude, which reminded me of that, that kind of idealized personality that the Bhagavad Gita speaks to uh, so often, the sthita pragnyaha, the person whose intellect is stabilized, who is a sthita dihi, whose mind is focused, who is samasukha dukkha, they call him, someone who remains stable in both happiness and sorrow. And he managed to use this kind of centering of himself to get through that very, very uh, terrible event. Um, we were very close friends. I traveled with him to India sometime. My wife and I, uh, Saliji, uh, we actually made a kind of a secular Tirta Yatra to Mudabidri, to Jaini's home area, to not, to, not only to see the, uh, the, the, the famous uh, Thousand Pillar Temple, 
but uh, also to uh, meet with the Chinese relatives there who were extremely hospitable to us and invited us to all kinds of family functions. It was a lovely uh, moment. And Jaini himself was also, even as he aged and became increasingly frail and, and managed to stay on his own in his house through the support of his friends and, and of course his, uh, his loving son, Dr. Aravind Jain, Jaini, who came frequently to either help him or bring him to campus. Although he grew increasingly frail, as I think you began to see in some of those videos where he leaned so heavily on the cane, he still had this youthful curiosity. He always wanted to know things and talk about things. And uh, it reminded me a little of uh, the famous verse from uh, Bhattahari's Shatakatrayam with, with a slight twist. Valibhir mukama krantam palite rankitam shiraha that you know your uh, your face becomes covered with wrinkles your hair becomes covered with all gray hairs your limbs grow weak the desire is still youthful and that means for him it was the desire for knowledge he was given over to that to pursuit uh, of knowledge which is one of the things i remember so well about him as for the scholarship we shared as is mentioned before, Jaini was a, a kind of walking encyclopedia of Indi Indian culture. He knew everything about everything. He could go on at great length, I think you got a little taste of in the video, about all manner of things, whether it was Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, the different castes of Maharashtran Brahmins that he could talk about for hours. He, he knew so much about uh, things like that. Uh, and and he, he was so non-parochial in his mind. He didn't just focus on one little area. He just brought all of uh, Indian and broader cultures into his uh, concern for Indian culture, language, religion, society, uh, and so on. Uh, he and I, we pop, pop into each other's offices uh, on a daily basis to ask a question, to look at a text, to bring an article, and so on. And he was open in that way, although he was busy. Although he was very senior, anyone, a student or a colleague, anyone could just walk into his office unannounced and he would say, come on, sit down. And then he would begin to talk. So it was very easy to get into his office. It was very difficult to get out <laughs> because he would say, no, no, wait, you have to tell you the rest of the story. So if you, if you didn't uh, have a very pressing schedule, it was fine. If you did, we would advise you, don't go in there because you won't come out so easily. But when you do come out, you'll know a lot more than you did when you uh, uh, came in. My collaboration with him, as some people have uh, addressed, mainly uh, had to do uh, with his work on gender and salvation. He, uh, Jaini, had the idea that the University of California Press wouldn't publish his book unless I wrote the preface to it. So I was given little choice. So he could be very uh, pressing and things like that. So we worked through together on the uh, kind of very interesting text, this uh, Sri Mukti Prakarana. And then he and I share an interest in these Jain Puranas, uh, particularly the versions of the you know, ancient Indian epic stories, Mahabharata and Ramayana, uh, and which he helped me greatly with. And I also worked with him on uh, and, and published on, on the uh, Pandava Purana, uh, as well as Jain Ramayanas. In fact, I began to think of him, you might say in Jain terms, as the uh, 64th Shalaka Purusha. He's the great outstanding person of this age of the world. So uh, I don't want to take more time since we're running a little bit over. Uh, I just wanted to um, speak back to something that was addressed by Professor Van Rospot earlier and a little bit uh, by uh, John a moment ago is, is the legacy of, of Jaini. We at uh, Berkeley, as Alex said, have a dream that we can establish some enduring monument, you could say, of learning to uh, the late Professor Jaini. We are hoping to develop, perhaps with the cooperation of the Jain community, uh, a Padmanabh Jaini chair in Jain studies at, uh, at uh, the University of California at Berkeley, which I think would be the most fitting uh, way of remembering uh, him. So um, with that, and if we could complete that, 
by his 100th birthday, which is not far off. That would be an amazing thing. Thank you, Premji. Um, and with that, let me just close by saying uh, that we take comfort in the loss of our dear friend by the saying, he is not truly gone, whom loving friends remember. Jai Jinendraji, thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Goldman. And we will now turn it back over to Savita. As I'm thanking uh, again, Professor Kurt and all the speakers, I'm remembering the Sanskrit quote saying, Padam hi sarvatra guneir nidhiyate. Good qualities put their footprints everywhere. As we are on the last leg of today's program, I would like to invite Birenji Shah for a vote of thanks. Birenji has been working extremely hard since last couple of months to make this event successful. Birenji, your energy and your enthusiasm is contagious and has inspired many of us to do our best. On behalf of Jaina and JCNC, I personally thank you for all your efforts and your dedication. Mr. Birenji Shah, JCNC president. Thank you, Savitaji and Jai Dinendra, everyone. I have the high honor and privilege to do a vote of thanks at today's remarkable global event. On behalf of Jain Center of Northern California, I express our profound gratitude to Guru Gans and each of the speakers for accepting our invitation to speak at this unique event, which is jointly organized with the Federation of Jain Association in North America. We fully appreciate and recognize you for taking time on Saturday morning and afternoon and evening this shows how much you care and respect Jainiji. JCNC is proud to have Mr. Jaini as one of, our, one of our founders. In two years from now, we will celebrate Jainiji's 100th birth anniversary, which also happens to be the 40th year of Jaina Foundation. Over the past four hours, we have learned a lot about Dr. Jaini, his erudition, brilliant teaching, incomparable memory, marvelous encounter and his tremendous sense of humor. This is truly amazing. Jaina and JCNC have been working on this event for over three months. Today's event was addressed by 27 speakers from six countries, USA, UK, India, France, Germany, Sweden, and multiple time zones. I know it's early morning in India, we are thankful to Charukirti Bhattarak Swamiji and Sadhvi Sangmitraji for blessing today's event. A special thanks to panel chairs, John Court, Tara Shetia, and Sulek Jain for insightful discussion. Thank you, Mahesh Wadar, Prem Jain, Girish Shah, and Parveen Jain for shedding lights on Jainiji and guiding me and other JCNC and Jaina volunteers in putting together today's event. I recognize Professor Hampraji, who in spite of poor health, made sure to provide us a written message. Thank you, Subodh Jain, Mohini Jain, Shagun Jain, Manish Modi, Rajendra Prakash Jain, Christy Wiley, Claire Mez, Shivani Botra, Nalini Balbir, Peter Flojer, Ole Quastrom, Chris Chappell, Bob Goldman, and Srinivas Reddy, who entertain us with an amazing sitar performance. Each of you is following the path shown by P.S. Jaini and your service in teaching Jainism to students is noblest of the noble profession. My dad is a retired teacher from India and having grown up in teacher's family, I first had know about teaching profession. In 21st century, Bhagwan Mahavir's message of nonviolence, mercy for all and good karma is more relevant and the need of the hour. Thank you, Savitaji, for your truly blessed and talented uh, voice in which you conducted today's event. You conducted today's live event in your melodious voice and uh, kept everyone truly engaged. Finally, I thank volunteers behind today's event, Technology, VP Nepani, Prakash Jain, and Nayan Jain, PR, Hitan Shah, Ravi Shah, Dimanwara, Sapandosi, Cultural, Sharad Dadbawala, Kamlesh Jain. And today's event was possible because of you. Thank you, everybody.
as I have started the event with saying, the song may be over, but the melody will linger on. The memories will linger on and the moments that you shared will forever be etched in your heart. Most of all, you will always be warmed by the thought that once in your life, you found someone extraordinary that you loved and who loved back. May the brilliance and beauty of their lives never be defined by their deaths. When someone passes on, it's so easy to just think about the pain and the grief that their passing has caused. The pain that you feel overshadows the life that they led. Shri Padmanabh Ji Jaini. Thank you so much once again, everybody, for your valuable time, for sharing your memories. And may the great minds continue to take the legacy to next level. That will be true Shraddhanjali to Shri Padmanabh Ji Jaini. Hai samay bada balwan sabhi chakkar khaya karte hai. Hai samay bada balwan sabhi chakkar khaya karte hai. Par kuch log aise hote hai jo itihas banaya karte hai. Kuch log aise hote hai jo itihas banaya karte hai. Pranam and Naman to Shri Padmanabh Ji Jaini. And it's my honor today to be the MC for such a great event. Thank you for having me. Jai Jinendra.